everything synced up. All right, welcome back, everybody, to another episode of the Southern Outdoorsman Podcast. We got a little roundtable going on here tonight. We have got a full house, so appreciate everyone coming out. I'm gonna I'm gonna go around and introduce everyone, starting to my left, Mr. Jeremy Aaron. How are you? Pretty good, doing good. Yeah, you, you tired after this expo? <laughs> I've talked more than the last two days, and I've talked in a while. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not a talker, but I talk up now. Yeah, so buddy. let's go. I hear that. All right, Jonathan Moreland, how are you, man? I'm good. I'm good. Yeah. I'm, I'm kind of like Jeremy. I'm I'm talked out for the day, <laughs> yeah. so, so maybe this thing will flow pretty smooth. Yeah, you about wore out. Daniel Lemon, what's up, man? Oh, not much. Had a great weekend up here. I'm ready to end her out on a good note. Yeah, absolutely. Scott Seals, yeah. how you doing, man? Man, I'm great. Yeah. I'm great. I hadn't talked to any at all. So. <laughs> <laughs> Carl Brown, what's up? Haven't glad. had you on the podcast in a minute. No, I'm three been a years. while. Glad to be here. And yeah. Glad to have you, man. And, of course, the ginger gunslinger. It's about to be bow hunter again this year. Just hold up. Yeah. Anyway, no, super excited to have everybody here. Uh, dude, by the way, Jonathan, I appreciate you coming out for the expo. Blast to finally meet you. Yep. Talked to you for a long time, man. It's cool to have, finally have you out here. Jeremy, awesome to meet you as well. Mm-hmm. And Carl, dude, it's awesome to have you out here. Drove all the way from South Carolina. And uh, excited to have you here. And Daniel, again, we're going to do a full episode with you. So just you, you're going you're gonna to get your time here in just a moment, okay? <laughs> all right, all right. But, uh, and then got Scott Seal. So I'm super excited about this episode. This is something I've been wanting to do for a little while after really interviewing Jeremy, not very long ago. By the time this episode comes up, probably about a month or so ago, we, we had interviewed you. And we talked a lot about river bombs and kind of like your method of madness when it comes to travel hunting and finding your niche and really focusing on your niche. And I was like, man, well, we're all going to come together for this Mobile Hunters Expo up here in Chattanooga, Tennessee. And... I'm like, well, Jonathan's going to be here, another river bomb hunter. The hunt's a little bit different from you and kind of different times of year and stuff. I'm like, we could have a pretty interesting conversation kind of doing a roundtable here talking about it. So real quick, I want to have Jonathan, actually, I want to have you take it away first. Just for listeners who maybe haven't heard you because it's been a little, it's probably been a year and a half or so since you've been on the podcast or a year or so. Uh, give listeners who maybe don't know about you or haven't heard about you quite yet. What is your, like, your background when it comes to hunting Arkansas and just like what the habitat's like there? And then mm-hmm. we're going to talk to Jeremy about his side. Okay. So, so in Arkansas, where I hunt, <clears throat> it's it's mainly river bottoms where we're hunting, and it's extremely flat, extremely flat, and these big hardwood open bottoms, and then <clears throat> a lot of a lot of the areas is broken up a lot with with thickets and and edges and stuff like that. And and I've talked to Jeremy some, and and we both, <clears throat> I think, some of the similarities we have when we when we say a ridge. We're, we're in this flatland that we hunt. We're talking about one, two foot elevation. Elevation, change. that's right. I mean, mm-hmm. not much at all. So when we say a ridge, it's it's not a whole. <laughs> it's not lot. a hill. It's is not it? a ridge <laughs> to most people. What most people think a ridge. So so we're we're really accustomed to hunting just just flat terrain mm-hmm. all all across the board. Um, I think um, something that we'll probably get into it that that the way me and Jeremy hunt a little bit different is I'm I'm probably my bread and butter is probably more early season I, I focus a lot on feed trees and stuff and uh i think jeremy really loves to hunt the rut right, and, yeah. and really likes that part so you know we can probably get into the get in a little bit of that and and uh talk a little bit that more yeah later. absolutely so jeremy again you were just on the podcast but i want to kind of rehash your, your background hunting in mississippi but learning how to hunt river bottoms and starting to go out of state and now as you travel out of state it seems like that's one of the first things you're looking for is some kind of waterway river bottom some kind of habitat like that that typically you're going to go to what has been like your background again as in just that skill set how long have you been hunting that kind of habitat and when did that really start for you oh i've been doing it for several years i think first time i went to Iowa was in 2003 so that's 20 years ago so you know going out of state doing it you know around home i was raised around a big core lake with a big river bottom in the back of it so uh, I've, I've started hunting, you know, I've done that for years, you know, for most of my life here, you know, mm-hmm. my hunting career. Now, with that, so this is an interesting factor that we're going to really dive into. And again, we got some other kind of, I'm going to call it almost like co hosts I've got kind of Daniel on here, because you, you probably know, you know Jeremy better than anybody else sitting in this room, okay? Other than his wife sitting behind us, which, you know, guys, I'm, by the way, this is a video podcast. So all the viewers can't see it in the, you know, podcast listeners can't hear her. Uh, unless, I don't know, maybe she'll start laughing here in a little bit if we talk, say something a little funny. But I'm, uh, I'm interested in Daniel. I, I want to kind of get your take on Jeremy and some of the things that you've learned from him early on, kind of hunting with him. Like, how long have you known Jeremy? And then what was your – what was, like, that transition like kind of hunting some of the stuff that he does, but you kind of do your own thing as well in kind of different habitats? Well, I think, you know, I've met him – well, I really didn't. Admit, I've known you all my life. Yeah, I've known him ever since. Yeah, since, since yeah, since since as long as I can remember. Um, 
and he just he really encouraged me going out of state getting out of my comfort zone as far as you know because i was always homebody as far as hunting around home yeah you watch a bunch of other you know shows and they're going here there and younger i'm like man i ain't gonna do that and he's like yeah you can do it i was like and i see him down like man you know he's freaking awesome and he's going all these places and he's like you want to do it i said well yeah but how do you do it he said nothing to it he said well, what do you like to hunt what are you used to and then he got me starting in arkansas um i guess 2016 was the first time we we went to arkansas um and the first year didn't do no good but man seen a lot of deer learned a lot um and then i think we skipped a year the next year i went i killed a big deer on the ground that is what lit the fire under me i was like you know what i sure enough can do this <laughs> and i have just went you know everywhere since uh, but mostly looking for what i know to hunt um, yeah now Real quick, I want to do a, a part of an introduction, but Carl Brown, we got Carl here. You hunt a lot more kind of like coastal plains areas. Uh, you know, your water is not safe. We're not talking about river bombs. It's a lot bigger water we're talking about that you hunt. Um, and I'll be interested, especially as we go through the conversation, some of your thoughts, because you're talking about hunting and, you know, tidal swings, you know, eight, ten feet of tidal swings and having a time when you're going in and when you're coming out so you're not beach, beach there, you're sleeping on your boat over the night. Uh, which is pretty fascinating and something that, you know, back on episode, I think it was 184 we had you on, we talked a little bit more details about that. And then Scott, you know, with you and, and your hunting style, you've hunted all over the place, but you hunt a lot in Alabama. I've had a lot of success in Alabama hunting feed trees. So I think there's going to be some similarity that we can talk between you and Jonathan that I'm real interested in discussing. Yeah, they're similar. And uh, <laughs> and also, you know, he seemed like, Jonathan, during your seminar, uh, Scott had a couple questions. He was trying to, you know, ask and beat around the bush on that. I think we may get up and uh, talk about it as well today. But, uh, Jonathan, I, I want to start kind of back with you and talking about y'all's two styles difference. You mentioned it early on. You're much more, like, if you were talking about specially, like, you're kind of much more of, like, a, a feature specialist. Early season, kind of getting into the rut, but especially like that early season time frame, finding that buck when he's using that feature and daylighting. And Jeremy, of course, big rut hunter, traveling, hunting the rut, but so same kind of areas. What's been one of the more, I guess, eye-opening things for you early seasons and hunting features when a lot of times guys are struggling that time of year? What have you been able to kind of figure out or, or start to put together as in, if you're looking for mature bucks, what does it take to find a mature mature buck in the feed on a feed tree down in the river bottom specifically? Well... You know, I've I've been doing it a long time, and in a lot of these areas, a lot of these WMAs and and uh, some of the refuges we hunt, I've I've hunted these for years. So the way this whole feed tree process works for me is <clears throat> the cool thing about when you when you find that hot feed tree, it's never going anywhere unless yeah. they come in and log it something. You keep so, up with the history. Huh? Exactly, you yeah. log that tree, yes. it's there. That's you, exactly you, exactly so, what I do. When I tell you I have almost countless features already found over the years, you know, it's just a process. Whenever you start, you just don't – you don't ever forget where these trees are at. You mark them. And, and my process starts early, probably August, uh, probably mid-August. I don't really – I don't do a whole lot of, of summer scouting. Um, I talked to Jeremy a little bit about it. Our deer, our summer patterns are very different from their fall patterns. So most of the time it's, it's pretty – irrelevant for me to scout this time of year uh, down in the area I hunt. So the big thing about the feed trees is I find these trees and I find these trees that are producing and they're not always going to produce every year. Sometimes they'll skip a year mm -hmm. for whatever reason. There's all kind of situations why they may or may not produce the next year. Um, but what I do is, is I, I find all these trees and I log them save them in your gps and then my preseason, my start to my scouting is i i start hitting all these trees i'm finding which ones are producing and the ones that are producing i'm already ahead of the game in august i can go ahead and if i want to place a trail camera on a tree that's producing fruit or producing hard mass i can go ahead and put a camera there and then i can come back when season starts and start checking my cameras and stuff and seeing as the trees start to drop, if anything's <coughs> starting to use those trees. So 
it's a lot of boots on the ground and it takes it takes a lot of time to cover all these spots and and honestly up to this point in my hunting career now everything that i've found in the past you know i, I can't even cover everything but i, I so now I, I try to cover the areas that have been good to me in the past you know so that's kind of how i start my my early season approach and then of course you know with anything in life you know you, you think you've got a plan and then something changes and you got to go to something else so you just kind of as season is rolling on then we may have to mix it up a little bit as as time progresses yeah absolutely uh scott i'm about to pitch it over to you real quick but before i do one thing i want to say for both uh jeremy and jonathan while we're going through this i would love for you guys <laughs> nice that's awesome you go to youtube guys see what just happened um I'd love for you guys to also go back and forth as well. Like, Jerry, I got a question. You have, you have, I'll go for it. Right well, Jeremy, I'll, 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 I'll get All right, come on. Y'all, y'all have well, at it. Well, I've always thought, what, like, like I said, I hadn't hunted a lot of feed trees. But what I've hunted, it seemed like they changed from week to week. Mm -hmm. So you really got to stay up on what they're using on. Yeah. But I guess you've got enough history. You sort of know what the they're moving. The history, <clears> the history so, keeps you. Yeah, the history keeps you. So you sort of know where he's going instead of having to, me having to hold scout and go like I like going to a new area mm -hmm. and find it quick. I, I'm not, I don't want a whole lot of history because I may not ever come back. Mm -hmm. But I, I sort of I want to I want to pick your brain on that yeah. right there. What's your thoughts on how the feed change, especially when acorns are dropping? Yep. So so a lot of times early season when I'm focusing on either like a persimmon or honey locust or usually a water oak, mm -hmm. and all these trees are dropping at the same time, uh -huh. and I was asked this question earlier at the, at the event today, you know, how long does a feed tree stay hot? And they all are different. You know, I've, I've hunted trees where that thing may drop out really quick, four mm -hmm. or five days. And then there's sometimes where that, I can remember two years ago, 2021, it was the absolute hottest tree I've ever hunted in my life. It was a water oak. And that thing dropped consistently for almost 20 days. I mean, just, you know, okay, kept plenty of food on the ground for but them. So they kept that, right, and after that twenty days or so, roughly, it was it was probably <clears> out. But but that tree just kind of sticks out in my mind because every time I hunted, I hunted that tree more than once, and every time I hunted that spot, you know, it was just I was it was just hammering deer. Okay, but but it kind of differs. Um, uh, usually, usually your persimmons are going to play out quicker than than your acorn trees are. Yeah, cause they drop pretty quick when right. they start. They right. Yeah, and. uh but man, those when those persimmon trees are hot, like my favorite tree to hunt is the honey locust. I talked about yeah. that earlier, just because I could usually target a mature deer on that honey locust. Um, but the persimmon, and I, I think I've talked to this about on the podcast. The we're we're going to rehash it, so don't worry. I because yeah, I want to ask so, about honey locust. So when that persimmon's hot, normally when I go up there, I always pick up four or five in my pocket, mm -hmm. and I'll carry them up the tree with me. And if I catch a deer out there. 50, 60 yards okay. or whatever. Exactly. Ah, you're going to make it right. Drop ah. it. That distinct thud, that joker's coming. <laughs> I've done acorns like that. I never yep. thought about it. Yep. Something like that. But, yeah. And honestly, the persimmon works better than the acorns because – A little heavier. It's heavier. <laughs> it makes a lot more of a distinct sound. And you just – they know. They, yeah, when right. they hear that distinct thud. Like, oh, that didn't drop. That's and a lot of times – a lot of times they'll pick their head up and they'll come right in. A lot of times they may be milling around, but they look. They know – what they heard, they go back to milling around, and then four or five seconds later, here they go. Yep. So, that is the honey locust. I got to get a question on it because I hadn't really ever hunted them. Mm -hmm. You said you hunt them early, but mm -hmm. late's not good. So, so they're, they're softer then when they first. So drop? normally, I'm pretty much done with that honey locust by probably probably seventh, eighth of November. It's usually it's usually played out. Okay. It's usually also a pretty good October to early November. Honestly, the the probably the second biggest deer i ever killed i killed him off a of honey locust uh killed him on november 5th but actually what was happening there is, is some does were coming in actually to feed mm -hmm. on those honey locust pods and that buck just he come in there and he just come in there to kind of he wasn't running the does he just come in there to kind of check them yeah but um so yeah typically that mid-november range that honey locust is probably it's probably played out Good cause and, it, and that's because when the acorns are really starting to drop yeah, okay. in, and then you're, you're kind of transitioning over to the acorn trees. The nut alls that I really love to hunt, red oaks. Oh, yeah, yeah. So they're really starting to drop that mid-November range. And yeah. those those are so scattered across the board. Sometimes they'll start dropping late October. I've seen trees hold and not drop till January, mm -hmm. which is awesome because then after the rut, you can go back right back to my early season 
tactic uh, skills. Tactic yeah. skills right yeah. back to the to the late season, and use the same thing, so it works pretty good. <clears throat> okay, I've got a little question about the feed trees. We don't have much. We have persimmons, but they're not very big. Um, don't get real mature, and they don't drop much. If you can happen to catch the handful they produce and be there when it happens, it's mm-hmm. great. Um, we don't have honey locusts, but we've got swamp chestnuts. We've got white oaks um, on some of the public land. A lot of the public land isn't open when those drop later in the year. But the majority of our feed trees, as far as red oaks, water oaks, um, I call them scrub oaks, but I think they're actually derivative of a live oak, laurel oak or something. Um, When they drop, there's 10,000 of them dropping. Mm -hmm. If one's dropping, they're all dropping just about in most of the places. How do you differentiate that place or (coughs) that tree from the other 9,999? that really goes back to what I, I really harp on a lot. <clears throat> I'm looking for that isolated tree that's next to a really and thick an cover. Edge, on, on an edge yep. or something. On an yeah. edge or, or some really thick cover that's actually away from most of the other trees of that species. For some reason, over the history I've had hunting and, the, and some of the, the success I've had, I've always found much better success on that isolated tree in very thick or the thickest cover I can find for mature deer. That's usually where they're feeling more comfortable. And that's usually where just about all the, the, the really good deer, mature deer that I've killed has always been on that isolated tree. That's away from those, whatever species of tree you're hunting. If, you know, let me just use persimmons, for example, like you were talking about, if I've got seven or eight persimmons over here. And a lot of times these persimmons are grow next to these sloughs and stuff. Mm -hmm. And, if I can find one off of this this batch over here, and more than likely, if you're finding seven or eight over here, there's going to be one somewhere pretty close. And I try to find that one in that thickest cover. And normally that that particular tree is going to have twice the sign on it than than those ones out in that more open open territory. So I've got a spot that has a line of mature white oaks, chestnuts red oaks it's a ditch line on the side of the property and there is one chestnut in a corner that is back in the palm meadows in a swamp would you sit that versus absolutely have you checked it have you ever gone? i've never sat that tree i never. just got a hold of this it's a little piece of private i got yeah um, this past year, and I've, I, I think I've sat twice on it. I, I got it right at the end of the season, yeah, and found that tree at the end of the season. Um, and, and and you know, I, really I preach on the <clears throat> on the isolated tree next to thick cover, but at the same time, I'm also I'm also paying attention to these what I like to call secondary trees because I'm really wanting to hunt on the ones that that has the most sign, but usually that isolated tree has the most sign not always not always the case but even though sometimes i might i'm still probably going to hunt that isolated tree granted i've got what i think is the right wind for me wherever i think the deer might be bedded and um usually that tree it just produces more success for me for trying to get one Mm -hmm. in close quarters uh to try to get a bow shot on and the the tree you, you talked about i mean that from what you described to me that that'd be the one I would be trying and to it go makes after. Sense. If I it had produced. a the one of the two times I got to sit that property before the season ended, and I had a mature buck come from that direction, and that was how I found that tree. I actually walked over there and yeah. walked back in the palm meadows and found it back in there, and he came from that direction, and I just <coughs> couldn't get a shot on him. But I th- I think that's where he was coming from, and that makes sense. Fine, that isolated tree, yeah. and it is by far the that yeah. entire property is open and, except and a lot of times and I, I talk about that isolated tree there may not be one there you know it's just that's what that's why i call it the ice cream tree because it's like the for me it's like the holy grail that's like if i find it. that one <laughs> i'm gonna have a pretty good hunt but that tree is you know it's hard to find that tree so it's it takes a lot of boots on the ground it, you have to have a lot of acres to cover you know i'm fortunate where i'm at in arkansas we have 
acres upon acres of public land or and i've got a little private land to hunt but on these big tracks of public land you really need a lot of ground to to cover to try to find that that, and that's what i call that ice cream tree you don't have a lot of land to work with you might not have that ice cream that little property is kind of the exception to the norm uh, around us where everything's thick yeah everything's just (coughs) thick cover if you can see 30 yards you're doing you know pretty good around your tree most of the time yeah it's just super thick and it's just hard to pick out individual feed trees and we try to hunt more so i'll give you a tip there what i like to do the feed trees Uh, early season it's very hard to to go out and and see feed trees from a distance so some of the the best feed trees i've found have been late season january february when all the foliage is off the trees and you can scan through there and like a persimmon tree will shine that thing will be black right out there diamond pattern bark you, you can't mistake it but that's a really good time of year to go out and scout because you can find all these trees it's a lot easier to walk through the woods in those thick areas when all the the leaves and foliage is is off the trees and also turkey season i turkey hunt a lot when i can um which actually i don't get turkey a whole lot because i'm so busy working then but if I'm out turkey hunting, I'm I'm really deer hunting. I'm, I'm deer scouting. Right, scout I'm looking I'm looking for feed trees. <laughs> I mean, I'm out there looking for a turkey or listening for a turkey. But I'm every persimmon, water oak, whatever I'm marking, and I'm like, hey, I'm gonna come check this. Come August, you know this this might be a good spot. So, just it's always a, trying to you know locate new stuff anytime I'm out. Yeah, and and and, so, and sometimes for myself, <clears throat> you're gonna you, you're gonna have to commit to a, a more of a kind of an observation sit. You know, yes, if you get that buck in, in range, great, works out great. But go in there with the intention of like, hey, I'm going to get in there, not going to bust anything, go up tree, sit, a closer observation, find out what the hell's going on in there. Mm-hmm. You know, you see that you see a deer that you can barely see back in there, movement and stuff, see that buck, and then – get on him the next evening and get in get in you know in bow range that's that's been one of the things to me you know just because there's you know 50 trees and they're dropping you you know you you need to get in there at times get in there with them where you can see and 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 see what's going on and then make your make make your move you know can i call them observation sits after i go in there and don't kill them (laughs) yes (laughs) always (laughs) A lot of people do that. <laughs> <laughs> a bunch of times, don't we? Yeah. <laughs> hey, I, I got a question for you, John. How far do you think he's going to travel to that feed tree? I know you don't know, but right. do you try getting yeah, – I know you're trying to find that per- perfect tree, but mm-hmm. usually how far do you th- is it usually from where you think you bet it? Like right. the big deer you killed in the middle yeah, of the day man. that day. How far do you think he really come from his bed? How far do I think he came? Yeah, I think. Uh, so, honestly, I think – where and i still to this day i don't know exactly where i do know the exact direction he was bedded because every time i seen him he was was coming from that way that's why that's pretty much why i knew and one of the reasons i never really bumped that deer because every time i saw him going or coming he was coming from that That direction direction. so i knew obviously we've already talked about this i think well we might jump into this real quick about the bedding yeah and the midwest guys preach on they can find that particular buck bed yeah um I think I mean you've agreed where we hunt that that's <laughs> yeah. that's not, not flying. Yeah. It, it ain't happening. No. Yeah, I mean but, they can bet anywhere. Well, I knew I knew I knew you weren't no exact, but I was wondering your gut feeling of how right. uh, how close was you re- was you within fifty yards? You just got up, come to oh, it, no, or do you I, think honestly, he was? Honestly, honestly, and and I'm I'm judging this on this one particular deer on okay. where he exited after I shot him. Okay, on the kill shot, I know he was wanting to head home. He's going back to safety. Yeah, and I know he was wanting to head home and. He actually made it, I want to say he was probably, as a crow flies from where I shot him, I want to say he made 170, 180 yards before he died. Yeah. And I know now when I found him, I know where he was headed to. I know the thicket now that he was headed to. Okay. And I'm going to say as a crow flies, that deer was probably 300 to 350 from this actual tree, which is actually farther than what I thought he was. Okay. I thought he was kind of bedding in this thicket before that, but when he exited out which and this is just assumption yeah i know, you know it's he, your opinion that's what i want my opinion, opinion yeah right? this is just assumption i feel like if he 
was staying where I thought he was, he would have went back to it. Back to it. But he didn't. He bypassed that, and he was trying to go further north to the next big, thick area of cover. And I think that deer actually okay. was going there. And that was about 300 to 350 yards as a crow flies to the particular acorn tree that I killed him on. Okay. What time of day do you kill the majority of your mature bucks feeding on those feed trees? Uh, without a shadow of a doubt, it's it's in the evening. The um, evening? That one particular big deer that I killed was an exception. I killed him at 1230 in the middle of the day. And uh, that was a day that the lunar tables kind of lined up kind of yeah. lined up that day and yeah. it, i think it was just a, a perfect scenario front moved in the yeah. day before i mean it was just i mean it was just money and actually it was so weird that day i killed that deer i mean i even said it on camera i just felt i just <laughs> i just felt like like hey it might happen i said i was there 15 minutes and you know he come out it was just like it was meant to be <laughs> but n without a shadow of a doubt on feed trees it's in the evening and a lot of times it's that magic time that everybody loves to hunt 30 minutes before dark, something like that, you know. Yeah. Um, I've killed the majority of the mature bucks I've killed that were feeding between 8.30 and 10.30 in the morning. Yeah. And the majority of the mature bucks I've killed, period, between 8.30 and noon one o'clock in the yeah. afternoon and i think that'd be a good question for jeremy because he hunts the rut so i would i would love to know you know during hunting that rut whether you like the morning or the evening well I, you sort of keep up with it you know year in and year out because you know what i killed this in the morning kill it mm -hmm. i've had about 50 50 but mm -hmm. it varies from year to year mm -hmm. you know some years you'll kill more in the evening some years you kill more in the morning but you go back and look at a five six seven year period it's about half and half yeah Oh, so I, but I think brings a lot of me back to my point. Always go hunting any chance you get. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> I, people ask all the time, "Well, should you hunt more? Or should you hunt anything?" Let me tell you, if Both. you got a chance to hunt, you should yeah. hunt. That's right. And by the time this episode, already, so by the time this episode comes out, about again a couple of weeks ago, we just did an episode with Scott. So we haven't mentioned about this with Scott on this episode. Scott he kind of claimed to fame hunting feed trees, and, and he's hunting in, in areas highly managed by pines uh, or timber, where he's hunting skinny little SMZs. And actually, the flip side about him, and this is something we talked a lot in his podcast, and I think we're going to have a ton of listener su success stories from, is because of that habitat and how close those bucks bed to those feed trees and they'll get up and feed throughout the day, he's had a lot of success killing big bucks in the mornings and, like, kind of later on in the mornings, early in the season. So, I mean, Scott, I do want to pitch it over to you and just get your take on that just while we're talking about feed trees. Because it's different, a lot different maybe than what, it, it, what he's hunting, you know, Jonathan's hunting as well. Yeah, I, and I think these, these deer are actually bedding closer, I think. Um, you know, they're within a hundred, 150 yards, something like that. Um, the key, when I talk about clipping my little trails through the pines, scooting through the pines, getting to the edge of the SMZ, getting to my setup, getting situated without bumping that mm -hmm. big deer. Um, but my, and, and, you know, this might might not amount to anything but it's my take on it is if they're up feeding at night they they go lay down about 10 o'clock they get a little urge to to feed they're getting a little hungry and they get up and they move 75 yards down into that smz well if you're in there without boogering anything up any kind of scent you know it's just been it's been good to me, you know. That, that you can take that for whatever it is. Now, those last thirty minutes is is king. It is king. I I I, I hear exactly what he's saying because so many times. But that later morning, up until noon, is queen. Um, it's it's. Yeah, they're that's what right I, that's there together. Well, on another thing, so we're talking early. So Scott, you're talking about early season in Alabama, which we're, we're hunting is like you know October 15th is when it opens, and the rut's not until much later. But with that, one one thing that I wanted to mention, and I wanted you to just talk about just in relevancy with the conversation is, you kind of have an idea potentially where those deer could be. You know, probably feeding down the bottom, kind of easing up to the pines. Like in Jonathan's situation, if it's all open hardwoods and there's there's thickets everywhere. 
It's hard to figure out what is that quote unquote negative train you can walk through in order to get to a spot that the deer is not going to be coming through versus like what you're the, doing where you're you're timing it going in just at daylight where those deer are kind of easing back through some of those pines and you're kind of slipping through the back side of it to then get up a tree once they've left those feed yeah. trees and then catching them coming back to it. Yep. Yeah, it's it's you know, and it's 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 cat and mouse. You you know, you're not always gonna it's not always gonna work out like you want. Get you know, not necessarily what I try to do when I when I cut my trail going through the pines is try to not go through and you can kind of figure that out once you get down in there cutting your trail and it's like oh, oh lord you know there's a bunch of beds in here and, and they'll be on little terrain you know they'll they'll be on little ridges and stuff so you can kind of figure that out and you're and you're going off that assumption of where where they're at but but if you can get in there just get in there clean that to me is 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 what works best it, it does um, uh, I, don't, I don't know exactly what, what yeah, you yeah what, perfect, what no, perfect. for there um i, I want to get uh john i got i got quite a few other questions and jeremy and everybody kind of you know chime in you know as, as y'all see fit you know the with feed trees, I, I want you to talk about the uh, how relevant it is to the area you're at. Oh, yeah. Uh, so, you, you've, let me tell you this. Since the first time we had it on the podcast, compared to, like, the second time we had the podcast, to the seminar and everything, you're getting better and better, my man, about, like, just, just – but, no, like, when I'm talking about communicating your thought process. Right. Well, and, like, some of this stuff we might have covered on the first podcast, but I really – I really want you to kind of go back into like the importance of the specific feed trees, that species that you target mm -hmm. and how some maybe aren't the highest sought after species, but because of pigs and bears and right. stuff like that, there's certain things that you may key in on that if it's in the right location with the right thick cover close by a mature buck's going to be using that food type. Yeah. Well, first of all, you brought up relative to your location and this is something that is extremely important that people need to understand. Jeremy knows this, Daniel knows this, these guys know this. But there are people out there that listen that need to know the relativeness of certain tactics for certain areas of where you're hunting. Mm -hmm. Hunting Arkansas is completely different than hunting Iowa. You're not gonna find a honey locust in a thicket in Iowa. <laughs> You know, you understand what I'm saying? I mean, that that's pretty extreme. But so my point is, is I've got a really good buddy in East Texas, and he's a very successful bow hunter. And he calls me all the time, and he tells me about all these honey locusts that they have in East Texas, and the deer won't touch them. They absolutely because they're so they're they're really thick, but they're not even in Arkansas. They're not the the predominant food source, but over there in East Texas where he's hunting, the deer just, they don't touch them like they do, like they do in the thickets of, of Arkansas. Um, so it, it's it's very relative to where you are in the country. It, you know, I preach on these trees and on these feed trees. It, it just may not be totally relevant to your area. So it's it's different as you go. I mean, it just uh, Alabama or Mississippi where Jeremy's at, I mean, there's, there's differences in – and certain things with these feed trees particularly you know the honey locust is kind of the exception a persimmon a deer's a leader persimmon anywhere i mean so i, I would feel confident mm -hmm. that you could get on persimmon trees um anywhere in the south and and and, and have a really good good deer hunt uh i know i've know very successful bow hunters in georgia uh louisiana mr warren womack mm -hmm. i met mr warren last year i mean that man's got more passion than a lot of people I've ever met, he's 70-something years old now. He works out every morning, and he'll preach to you all day long about a, about a persimmon tree <laughs> or, or, a, or a water oak, you know. And um, So the, the whole feed tree deal that I preach on, I think, you know, it, it's just – it's really relative to where you're at. And, and the species, that that's to me is like the big thing because like – where you're at, one thing you mentioned is like, you know, you get the nut alls and everything else. And mm -hmm. while I was in Arkansas this year, I found overcups for the first time. I've never seen overcups before. Like, I, I think they're in Alabama in certain places, but I've never seen one. Mm -hmm. In this one swamp I went into, this little river bottom thicket, there was a couple massive 
over cups, and they were getting hammered. And it was so – they were right up against the water. There was some thick marsh, like swamp stuff next to it. The deer were coming out of there, like mm-hmm. walking across this water, coming across from a super skinny peninsula that jutted out into the swamp river bottom. They were crossing this little slough, coming up in this big flat where these three huge – I mean, gi- like four of us couldn't get our arms around these over cups. They were mm-hmm. huge. And it was just tore up. I'm like, I don't know how to hunt this because I can't get a stand or sat on these trees because there's no way I can get in the tree. I can't sit on the ground. It's bare. They've literally tilled the whole ground, and it's nothing but water. So I'm like, am I going to sit down in the water and waders? Maybe should have tried that. That'd be kind of <laughs> weird because with the, with the ripples and everything. And I didn't even hunt that spot. And right next to it, there was a stand, a little grove of persimmons that were dropping. And this is, again, this is uh, this is actually kind of late. This is uh, right before Muzzle It was like first week of October I was in there. And um, the persimmons were still dropping, and they were hitting the persimmons, and they were hitting the persimmons coming up and hitting those uh, those overcups. And, again, it was so – they had tilled that ground. There was no ground cover. It was yeah. just thick swamp stuff that like you're standing in water. Like, literally, I'd sink up to, like, my knee in that yeah. stuff. And then it was, like, bare ground where they had it tilled up. I'm like, and I, there's no tree to get in. I don't f- can't figure out how to sit on the ground because if they pop out there – Eight ten yards from me, yeah. and it might be a doe first before any buck comes through. And it was like super challenging, but it made me realize in some of those areas where you have those super productive trees that the the species that they want to hit, how much those deer will be on that sign, mm-hmm. and uh, kind of like Scott said in his his episode we did with him a few weeks ago, I bumped deer from that spot. They blew ran off. I was just hanging out for a little bit, and they came back. But it was does, yeah. not bucks. They, but they circled trying yeah. to come back to that spot because they wanted to be here that bad. Yeah. And now I'm kicking myself trying to figure out how did I hunt that spot. Well, I, I'll tell you another thing about the persimmon that, I, that I'm thinking of right now that that would really be um, for beginning hunters and newer guys that really want to know. They because I was asked this question today at the event. How do you know that is a hot tree to hunt? A really specific tip I can give people for persimmon trees to know if that tree is hot, if it's that time, if it's dropping. Obviously, you're going to see sign on the ground. But in the south, if it is a very hot persimmon tree, 90% of the time, there'll be a coon or two up in that tree. <laughs> Just about all the time. Those coons love persimmons. And if that thing is juicy and ripe, they, you know, the best dropping, tree, they know where to come. <laughs> and and that's that's one of the downsides of hunting a, a persimmon. Also, is is you got to deal with, with the coons up and down the trees all the time. Coyote, and coyotes, coyotes. coyotes. I've terrible. killed coyotes on persimmons. How Lots big do y'all's persimmon trees get? Do what? How big do you persimmon trees get? Oh, they they range in size. Even the, the very small ones produce a lot of persimmons. But most of the time, the ones I have most success on are. I mean, are really. I mean, they can get really big. Uh, now those trees are probably more rare than the small trees. About the, I would say average size, you know, this this big around. But now I mean they can get, you know, Whoa. this big around. Yeah. Oh, for, the, audio, for audio listeners, he's talking like I mean like that's swamp persimmon. Huge. Yeah. Swamp yeah. Persimmon. yeah. Swamp <laughs> persimmon. Thirty, <laughs> like 30 yeah. inches yeah. across. Like, you know, I know a lot of guys are listening. and You're thinking, you know, four or five inch. Trees. Yeah. The ones now, I found I'm talking were, about. Yeah. I mean, I'm. Big trees, no, wow. pretty, pretty big for us. Yeah, right. Salt yeah. timber tree. Yeah. Yeah. Look at you think you cut lumber yeah. out of that. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Pretty big for us is a little taller than that door. Oh wow, like, that, that's what I'm talking. <laughs> oh like, no, I'm they talking drop. about a tree, man. That's <laughs> not a tree. That's, <laughs> a bush. Well, that's, that's <laughs> like our. Pres- I've seen, but that it. just goes to show you how how relative. You know, it's it's I've seen a couple, maybe as big as my arm or yeah. so. Um, but most of the ones I find are chair high. Yeah door high so i'll tell um, you this uh size of my of, pinky finger yeah you know, a lot like, of times and I've, I've done this many times a lot of times i can't find a perfect tree to set up on that persimmon tree i'll climb the persimmon tree and hunt out of the persimmon tree i don't particularly like to do that but if that's a last last case resort i, I will do that i've maybe seen two or three in my life that were maybe big enough you could Put, yeah, and, uh, that, and that's maybe that's a, a cool point because that just something. that just shows you that there's kind of the you know big differences. Too. I mean, they, they, I've seen big ones, but uh, generally, like what you're calling a small one, you know, size of volleyball. Yep. Uh, I did, I honestly didn't know they, they even just got that don't big. Key, yep. They don't yep. key on them as much. Yeah, up there. Yeah. yeah, they just but don't. Yeah, but Jonathan's talking about big uh, hardwood bottoms now. That's right. He's talking yeah. about big yeah. timber. <coughs> that's yeah. right. It, it, yeah. It's, it's yeah. just – y'all, y'all were talking about keying in on persimmon. I'm like, how do you know when those two drop? 
Because <laughs> 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 they, yeah. they look like we'll find them, but they they grow two and they're gone when <laughs> yeah. you come back. That I afternoon. mean, no kidding. On a, on a really hot persimmon, I've I've probably got three to five coons in that tree. And the, and then and them suckers are lazy. They'll sit up there on a limb, lay out, <laughs> and reach out, out, reach out and grab, a reach out and grab yeah. one. They living a good life, man. Yeah. Just reach out there <laughs> and grab them, com- and never grab them a piece tree. of fruit and hang yeah, out. So we and, have and that I'm with sitting uh, there, dude, They get the palm out of berries right out of the now, you know? <laughs> out of the cabbage palms, They're the big palm trees. They get up on top of them and yeah. grab the big palmetto berries that grow on top yeah. of them. Jonathan, I, I'm kind of curious about. You mentioned like you like to go through and mark where your feed trees are at, mm-hmm. especially later in the season, so you can come back and you can run through and you can start checking those in August. Do you have like a little mental checklist of of marking a certain tree? Because I haven't really ever hunted where you hunt, but to me, it seems like in these giant hardwood bottoms, there's just freaking like water oaks and stuff. I, I feel like they'd just be everywhere. So it's like, how do you know to mark this one versus right. that one? So obviously. Uh, I I use Onyx like probably everybody today, but I can honestly say that if it has been a tree that is produced and I've had even a decent amount of success, and I mean just seeing deer over that tree, I don't, man, I do not forget where that is. Yeah, and I, and I've got it marked too. That's but I've got, thing. you know, all, out of all the trees I've found in the, all my years of bow hunting, um, I still – and I still have those special trees that, that I want to go back and check, you know, that have produced over the years. So, you know, I honestly, I don't really – I can't say that I forget, you know, the ones that, that have produced produced pretty good over the years. And and, and I'll say this, you know, uh, me and Jeremy are talking about it's They all don't produce every year. Um, matter of fact, um, the, the largest deer I'd ever killed on public land in Arkansas – I have not killed a deer on that tree since that particular okay. buck I killed. That's what I, I was going to ask. That was in 2017, I believe, when I okay. killed that deer. Well, that's what I was going to ask you. Had you ever killed a deer on that tree before mm-hmm. or after? So it's no, nope. it just that one that one, one perfect year. It, okay. it produced. It, it did really good that year. And that, and there was uh, one other. And I and trust me, I checked. That's one of the first trees I checked. <laughs> every single year just because it's special to me yeah so i go and I, I check that tree every year and two years ago that sucker produced really well but two years ago is when i had a picture of that freak deer that i was trying to hunt so i never even went in there i had it i could have very well killed a, a probably killed a mature buck on that tree again i didn't hunt at that particular area, and by the time i got the deer I was hunting on another property when I got him killed, um, it was already too late for me to to go back to that tree. Done. What species out. was that tree? That was a honey locust. Honey locust. <laughs> yeah. Now I, I want you to mention this because I don't think I remember here you talking about this necessarily the, the first time we had you on where we really talked about feed trees, um, hogs, mm-hmm. pigs. So again, talking you know talking relevant to certain areas. Some places have pigs, some places don't. Some of the places you're actually, it seems like all the places you have. Every single place I hunt has pigs. So how does that play a factor when you're talking about feed trees? Because pigs love persimmons, they love acorns. I mean, what? how does that play considerations? First off, in checking, making sure this is deer sign, maybe you can simplify that. It's probably not hard to explain. But understanding, like, what species of feed trees can I focus on that maybe I'm not going to have as many pig encounters, if any pig encounters. Right, and that that is that's definitely why when people ask me what's your favorite feed tree to hunt over it's all I, I always say the honey locust and that that is one of the main reasons why because i know that even though that is not the particular favorite species for the deer it's the least favorite species of feed tree for the hogs they would rather go to the persimmon or the acorns than they had that honey locust and for whatever reason that honey locust i always find more buck sign around that honey locust i also always have more mature deer pictures early in the season on a hot honey locust if i find i can find a hot honey locust so for me that that's kind of why that is my go-to if i can find that tree but i'll say this also that is the hardest tree to find that is the hardest ice cream species honey look that is the hardest one to find i can find a bunch of the persimmons i can find a bunch of the water oaks but that pristine honey locust that that is the the hardest one to find that the that the deer are really using so 
it's kind of a it's kind of a double edged sword there. You know, you just kind of got I just kind of got to play it year by year based on trail cameras and and what I know is in the area. So that that's kind of how I, how I go by. Now, one thing I, I want to touch on is, uh, and we did this in the seminar, but I'm going to ask you again because some people aren't going to hear about the seminar. Um, trail cam strategy with features. Mm -hmm. Some guys will just find a hot feature and they'll go sit it. It seems like you like to put trail cameras mm -hmm. out. Talk a little bit about trail cam strategy. You know, when, when you're talking about putting trail cameras on a feature, how soon, especially if you find hot trees right before season comes in, if something starts dropping a little early, how soon do you start putting cameras out in some of those locations? How long do you leave them for, check them, move them? What, what's your thought process on running cameras yeah. on features? So I, I'll, I'll tell you my process, what I do. When I go out starting in August and I'm, I'm running, I'm checking all these features that I found over the years, Every single one of them that has that have produced, whether it be a persimmon or, or honey locust. In August, you can tell. You can take your binos. You can look up there. You know which Definitely ones are gone. produced. So what I like to do is, uh, for me, the ones that I really – that I put my camera on first are the ones that I've had history over, that I know, hey, this, is, this has been a spot in the past. I'm definitely going to get a camera here. Obviously, I don't have – I, I'm, I can't afford enough cameras to put out on <laughs> every tree. feature that I know that's produced. I just, I can't afford to do that. I wish I could, but I can't. <laughs> so, I, you know, I, I find the ones that I want to put out, they, they've produced. I go ahead and get those cameras out in August. I won't come back and check those until the first week of bow season. Some of those trees, most of those trees should be dropping by then. Most persimmons, sometimes not. Sometimes they're a little later. So I will start going back on the first trip that first probably that first week of bow season, checking some of these cameras. Now granted I can't go I can't cover all the area that I go out and put these cameras that I've done in August. So I just I just wherever I'm at, that's where I'll start going and checking these cameras. And then as I'm starting to get pictures of deer, that's when I start narrowing my area down. So if I've got and I and and before I get into picking out a deer I, I i always like to tell people you know i'm not a trophy hunter but in arkansas I, I only get two bucks and we have a very long season september to february um and and fortunately i get to hunt quite a bit in the fall probably more than the average person because of my job we, we're pretty busy in spring and summer but i get pretty flexible in the fall and winter so the only reason i'm really trying to target a mature deer or a big deer is because it prolongs my season so when i find that big deer that i want to go after then i'll really start monitoring my cameras even more i'm I'm probably more aggressive on going in and checking my cameras more often than most people i would say i, I often hear people say well i put my camera up i don't like to go back i don't like to get sent in the area well even though i get ample time to hunt in the fall that's still not enough time it's still not as much time as i want to so I'm pretty aggressive on going in and checking these cameras quite often to, to monitor to see if this deer is using this tree because you've got a certain window when that when that tree's hot, like we were talking yeah. about earlier. You've yeah. got sometimes it's five days, sometimes it's twenty days, but but if you're not there during that window, you've missed it. So so if I didn't go check that camera within that five to twenty days and saw him there, you know, tried to put a pattern to him, if I go back. 30 days later to check my camera well you you might have missed the whole drip your that tree's done and he's off somewhere else or the ruts kicked in and he's in bfe so that's kind of how i how i approach the the trail cam process interesting anybody got questions on the trail camera strategy he explained it pretty good uh, yeah. that's it it could make a lot of sense how so, you, you you key in you wait and you key in yeah one on the yep. trail cameras do you run cell cams at all so unfortunately the areas i hunt m most of that area doesn't have cell signal i've got very few areas that i can actually run a cell camera which it would be freaking awesome <laughs> if i could <laughs> have <laughs> uh, <clears throat> but that also goes back to how expensive a camera cell cameras are expensive and you're yeah. dealing with data plans and that's something I just can't do. I've started I have getting some into of them. them a little bit and starting to run a few yeah. in a few spots without without uh, name you know, 
name dropping yeah. areas. Yeah. There's some places we can we can legally put them. Some places yeah. we can't. Um, and I don't know if y'all can mention names of uh, like companies for cameras. Or oh yeah, that's yeah, fine. That's fine. Just don't they, mention public. No, yeah, don't mention land. Or no, no, no. no. <laughs> um, man, that Moultrie Edge has just yeah. been. It wasn't possible for us to run cameras because yeah. of the tides and everything. Yeah. Um, you just you couldn't keep up with them. You, it might between me being on call on the weekends here and there. I I basically get twenty something days a year to hunt. Yeah. And out of those days, I get to hunt certain. Uh, we can't hunt public land on Sundays, so that cuts that in half for the days I can hunt the WMAs, then it, it's cut in farther down by what we can do tide wise, where we can get in. And some of the place, some of the federal stuff is open on r- Sundays and it is about those, uh, those mulcher can't as just, they're the only ones I found that I've turned on and work without having to, do yeah. updates and this, that, and the other. They and they pick up any service. They don't use one service. They pick up anything. So far, they've worked everywhere I put them, even on some of those outskirt places. But um, everything you've been saying is almost identical to what I do. Just exchange feed trees for bottlenecks. Like I would have missed those. You were talking about that peninsula. Those deer come off near the high ground edge. I'd have missed those feed trees and just hit that peninsula. I'd, 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 I'd never even looked for the feed trees and just gone to that peninsula. But literally, almost everything you've talked about is almost identical to what I'm doing, except for I'm not looking for feed trees. I'm looking for the bottleneck they yeah. have to go through to get to all the feed trees but we have so little any of my competition out there around those islands listen to this a little little secret and we, so those tides it's high tide and 12 hours later or six hours later it's low tide 12 hours it's high tide again so you get out on the marshes and stuff like that you have a time clock on tracks and if you you can tell which one was the last one the one before that one before that you find a track that is fresh going one way one tide earlier going the other way one tide earlier going the other way so on and so forth you know he's coming back and forth and he's done it three or four times in the last 24 hours. And you know he's on a route because it's every six hours. And it's been washed out once. It's been washed out twice. And after a day or two, it's gone. So you know that's one of the biggest things I look for is that time clock on those tracks. And I'm trying to find that one track that's the size of my hand going back and forth multiple times but it's kind of like a hot feed tree that little that four inch wide trail going across that salt marsh is kind of like my hot feed tree yeah because you got fingers you got um a lot of those islands have like long fingers but they're covered in oaks they're in it's palmettas that are waist shoulder head high that are solid across the entire island and there's almost no break in them you can't hardly see the ground i mean you get you see pieces of a deer at a time there's a, the finding sign under the trees and stuff is, is difficult at times to even yeah. find tracks up on the high ground but the marshes are key and yeah. it, it's those time stamps on those tracks that really really put us on them as far as what they're using when but there's also a time limit to when they're using them based on where they're feeding on the different trees when and they move around the islands and stuff and we're we're looking for those trails and we're essentially looking for that hot thing but it may last for four days in a row it may last for two weeks in a row but there's there's a stopwatch on it it ends yeah 
and they move here and there. But it, it's interesting hearing you talk about what y'all are doing out there. For it's almost identical. We're just using different things. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. Uh, I've got I got some other uh, in questions I, I want Jonathan to kind of discuss. Um, when we're talking about the the feed trees and, and trail cam strategy and all that kind of stuff. One thing that I think a lot of people come to mind, and I'm asking some questions actually actually during the seminar. So if anyone was at the seminar, they kind of heard this a little bit beforehand. How important is it for you to have a buck on daylight versus if you have him at night and it's a it's a, it's a target buck? You get a photo of him like you got one photo. I know you use Tasco cameras. You mentioned this earlier, and you don't care you about the quality the camera. I just need to see. I, I, I say I, I let the guys in on the seminar on that. You didn't have to say that on the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> but the, you can edit that out. <laughs> yeah, the, the, but but with but listen with the whole situation of just running all those cameras. How do you go about either moving cameras or, or trying to figure out where Buck's coming from if he's not on your camera? If it's in season, he's not on daylight, but he's maybe he's in that within that hour and a half hour window or so of um, say in the evenings, like it's just after dark. He's showing right. up are you doing anything in order to try to get closer to him or is it much more just waiting on that timing and, and, and at some point he should show up on that feed tree right. or during so, the so typically I do <clears throat> if I'm keying in on a on a particular deer um and I always don't key in on sometimes I just want to go hunting I'm just looking you know going hunting looking for the mature deer or whatever I want to kill yeah. that day yeah. but if I'm focused on a particular deer I do like to have at least one daylight picture of him but there are times, and I've had this work a couple of times, there are times when I might have a deer that I'm keyed in on. I haven't got a daylight picture of him yet, but he's he's that 30 minutes after dark. What I'll do then is, and me and Jeremy, we were talking about this earlier, if it's early season and then we have that first cool front of the year coming in, them lunar tables are lined up right, 4.30, 5 o'clock in the evening, yeah, man, I'm going to the tree. I, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that I'm hoping that hey, he's going to show up. This is going to be the first time he shows up at daylight, and I'm going to be sitting there 12 yards over him. Well, you know, with an experience, it's yep. worked before. Yep, that's why you're yep. looking for that. Yep. Yeah, and and we've talked about that. That that first front, I mean, and, the, and that lunar table's lining up. Whether you want to go in the morning or the evening, yep. I mean, you know, you're just confident in that, and you and there's no reason to sit back and think, hey, he's not coming in in daylight. I'm gonna wait. Till I see him in daylight, that that may be the that may be the day like the day you get him on on camera, and you've got an opportunity to be sitting there, but you're at home on the couch because you're saying you're thinking to yourself, well, he's not showing up in daylight. I'll wait till he shows up in daylight. That may be the day you need to be there. And from past experience, that first front, first cool front, my lines up with the lunar tables for that particular evening. Yeah, I'm I'm going to the tree that day. I want to ask you something because I asked Scott Seals this exact same question um, when he's hunting the very individual feed trees and very skinny bottoms where there's not a ton of options. If you know there's a big storm coming through, mm -hmm. and I'm not talking about hunting a front because there's going to be deer movement, of course, mm -hmm. but you know there's going to be a storm coming through, high winds, it's a Heck good yeah, chance there's going to be a lot of food on the ground. The next day. You're, What's your uh, thoughts on that? Yeah, you're, <laughs> so, yeah, big storm comes through that night. Blows a bunch of bunch of soft mass, hard mass on the ground. Heck yeah, you want to be in the tree the next day for sure if, if you're able to hunt. Yeah, it is on. Yeah. Now, but with that, if say it blows out, this especially in your area with a lot of acorns. And uh, man, I just said acorns. Now, I was just about Dang. to say, you switched it up. Ooh, you listen, said both of them in one podcast. Now. I, I know I'm acorns. I'm going back. To, I'm going back to my roots. <laughs> you got too many beers. No. Um, <laughs> oh, is he an acorn guy? Acorn. He says acorn and acorn. He no, switches. I, I say acorn because I'm getting peer pressure because everybody else here is saying acorn. Oh, dude. Andrew only starts saying that because I, I heard. You, if you're from Mississippi or Arkansas, you say an acorn. <laughs> <laughs> there ain't no doubt about that. Andrew only starts saying acorn because he heard uh, uh, Clay Newcomb start saying it. No, that's and, not. Yeah, true. He, that, that's <laughs> that's a little bit true. I'm not gonna lie. It's yeah, a little bit hey, true. Clay, Clay Duke can made the acorn famous, uh -huh. but I, did, yeah. I promise you that acorn been there a long time. <laughs> 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 so, but but with that, so with the storms, the only question I would have is if there's a, a excess abundance of food on the ground, if you're still finding that that if you're still trying to focus on that primary tree, that uh, ice cream tree you call it, the one that's closest to the bedding, kind of the isolated tree by itself. 
will they still probably hit that tree before they go to the larger mass? So especially if we're talking acorns, acorns that are on the ground, is it still that's the tree you're going to, or will you adjust anything based off if you know there's a ton of food now on the ground? Yeah, no, I'm I'm still going to focus on that on that tree in that thick area, and and the main reason is because you know if, if that isolated tree I'm talking about that that I find in those thick areas a lot of times, and and Jeremy's asked me earlier how far do you think that deer's bedded? A lot of times that thick area that that tree's in, I'm thinking that deer's you know a lot of these are thickets, yeah, they cover acres you know yeah, it's, it's not like i know it, it's relative to where you are in the country <laughs> you know we might have a 70 acre cutover or a or a, you know where a tornado blew through acres upon acres of ground and it just it's it covers a lot of ground so a lot of times these these isolated trees i'm finding um you know i'm thinking that deer may be in the same in that same thicket um you know we we talked about that one deer earlier that was just that one deer for him I would have thought he was half that distance. You know, I would have thought he was 150 yards from me, but, yeah. but uh, you know, and that was just an assumption from where I found him dead. You know, I felt like maybe he was better than that next ticket. But, yeah, so say a storm comes through, and I know there's hundreds of acres on the ground. I'm still going to want to hug that one with that thick cover for sure. I always think of it, and when I call it the edge, you, you, you're looking at that, that thicket, yeah. isolated tree. I, I, I kind of I use that as my edge. Yeah. As my edge. Yeah. But I look at it as where's the first place he might show while it's daylight. Yeah. And more than likely it's going to be there. It's going to be there. He's going to start from there. Right. So if he goes undisturbed there. And yep. Gets dark. He can go in and do whatever he wants. That's once right. He gets dark. And, the, and and I always look at it as like that. And that's most the of the time, same situation. Yeah, that, that's the way I usually play ways. it. But we all know nothing's a hundred percent. Yeah. You know, you think you got him figured out. He's coming to this tree in the thicket, and guess what? He's out there feeding on them no, wide open trees. I mean, you know, <laughs> that happens. It's, it's, nothing's a hundred percent. So you just make your best guesstimate and, and roll with it. Yeah, I want to. I want to get into something. Uh, I don't know if you, no, but, no no I'm gonna change it but I want to see if you're gonna say what I was gonna say uh, probably not so, so I, I wanted to go into I wanted to go into bucks hunt a little bit because <sighs> okay. Carl what you okay. just said a minute ago with the tidal swings and and you're looking at tracks and you're aging that track based on what you know the tides have been doing over the last couple of weeks like that that is super fascinating and and how you're keen in on that and that's kind of like your hot sign <laughs> I know I'm giving away the secrets here I already gave but it away but I, I'm curious I'm curious I'm on pee. uh what. <laughs> supposed to say that (laughs) (laughs) i'm curious about throwing that to the other river bottom guys so like jeremy and we talked a little bit about this with you when you were on with us a couple weeks ago uh on what sign means to you in the bottom and i guess you know we, we can talk about feed sign a little bit but i'm also really curious about just general tracks rubs scrapes and i know we talked about scrapes a little bit and there's probably a, a pretty good rabbit hole there we could go down but i mean in general what are the what are the kind of things that you're looking to key in on when you're basically on the ground looking to make something happen and and you're trying to figure out exactly where you want to get well like i said i'm hunting a little bit later i'm hunting during the rut i'm looking more from roaming instead of going short distance to feed mm-hmm. you know I'm, usually the big deer i kill they're up traveling they're up looking so um I'm looking for fresh tracks. You know, I love a fresh rain to come through. And then you got a fresh, you got fresh tracks in the rain. It rained last night. You know that's fresh. Oh, uh, because a lot of times in the bottoms, it's hard to tell fresh tracks if it hadn't rained in a week or two. Uh, so that's what I'm looking for. Scrapes. You know, I, I said I always like hunt community scrapes or around them. Uh, and I always say I'm a lot different from Jonathan. Jonathan, Jonathan a lot of times he's keying in on a deer when he's found a big one. I don't like spending enough time in the area to find a big deer. I'm I'm bouncing in there, trying to go in there in a day or two and take out a three or four of mature deer. So I'm I'm hunting a particular sign, uh, rubs, scrapes, and stuff like that, and tracks is is what I key on when I go into a bottom like that. Okay, uh, any kind of spe- specifically with rubs, is there anything that you're specifically looking for with rubs? Like we've talked to a couple guys who will say that they're looking for something that's like really gouged out, where you can tell he's got a lot of you know little uh 
No, he, he's got gnarly bases or something like that, or, or maybe the height of a rub. Are you keen on anything like that? Well, a lot of times a rub a tail, especially if it's got a little size to it, it it'll determine what his horns are like. Oh, uh, you know the. I always say if, he, if he's rubbing a tree here and there's one six inches behind it and he's hitting it good, well, you know he's got good bean length. He's reaching around. If he's rubbing and way up here high, there's gouge marks or just touch marks. Well, you know he's got long tines. That they're they're really hitting up high. I remember I found one in Kansas years ago. It was just a tree and it's like like a bear gouged that sucker. It was just they was deep. Well, a day or two later, the guy killed him. He had eye guards, not like not like the one Daniel killed, but it, it was probably like eight inches, but it stuck straight out. And he, you could tell that deer was just sticking them in, just gouging up and down. So, you know, I pay a lot of attention to that to sort of determine what I think his horns look like. Mm -hmm. and, and with you being so, like, transient, like you're always jumping around and you're always kind of going to new areas, how fresh does that sign have to be for it to actually matter to you? Well, specifically the rubs, I guess. Well, well, the rubs, rubs just tell you sort of what's in the area. You don't know really when. You can tell if it's fresh, leaves are falling, if there's... If there's sawdust, I call it, where they, they're scratching the bark off and it's laying on top of the leaves, you know it's fresh. Mm -hmm. But most times, they may have done made the rub there. I just sort of know he's in a, especially if it's a big community scrape, I'm just sort of hoping he's coming back through the area. And, and especially I'm hunting area with does. If I'm, I'm hunting rut, I'm hunting does too. Oh, because that's what <coughs> they're roaming through, they're looking for. Oh, so that, that, that's what I would say I would key in on that. Okay. When, when you talk about rut, I look at it as, and and kind of the way we hash it out is, you know, you got you got your your pre rut, which we call them. Uh, they're trolling, they're roaming, they're on their feet, looking as to pose to when you talk about the tracks, because that's what we, uh, me and me and my little gang. Uh, once we start keying up with them, we start looking for our chasing tracks. Are Running you, are tracks, you look, yeah. yeah. are you looking for chasing tracks, uh, looking for a big set of buck tracks that's a lot, walking a lot of, with a lot of my tracks? Self because I consider you got your trolling, roaming stage, and then you got your sure enough Hold chasing up. stage. Is that what – Well, here, here's how I look at I judge a rut. That first cold front close to the rut. You're gonna get buck activity. Mm -hmm. Seems like that that That's cold weather, that double and, digit temperature and change. Yep. He's up. He's 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 cleaning his scrapes. Yep. You know he's yep. traveling. You know he yep. knows his dominance there. He's patrolling his area. Yep. He's looking for that hot dough. And then you get that later stage. I I think Daniel will say too. We've had better luck on the backside of the rut killing the big deer. I think they've done bred does. A lot of the does have done got bred. Smaller does coming in. Yeah, and smaller does coming in, yep. and it, it seems like when and a lot of times you like to see two or three bucks after one. And you, it's that later end of it, and a lot of times we don't really kill them chasing does. It's just like they're roaming, looking. It's just you know you see them coming yeah, through the woods well, like they're on a mission, just going in a bee bee line, going somewhere. Now, they may be going to that next thicket when checking it from the lower side. Heck of a lot easier to kill one walking than it is running. That's right. Yeah, it, it's hard to kill one with a doe, yeah. chasing a doe. She's yeah. got to come right by you, yeah. and you, she's got to get by without busting yeah. you, yeah. and then get him. So yeah, that's, I, I that's, that's just spe being specific because, you know, I, I, I just I know the way we kind of play it out, you know. Yeah. Once we see them chasing, it's just like – but then you're still going to have other bucks that are that are just, you know, walking a clear cut looking but know. but now daniel's done good I, I love hunting this way i can't film that way it's it's almost impossible to film so i've, I've got away from it when they're rutting hard and locked in the lockdown stage mm -hmm. daniel will get well you can tell his he likes to get a wind in his face and just sort of slip because a lot of yeah. times you, you catch them on yeah. the ground with a doe yeah. you can pretty They'll much be get, standing over them. yeah you, you, it, it, they're yeah, easy to kill like that learn there when yeah they're, when, they're, when you when you you, 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 especially if you standing get, over a doe waiting her, for her to get up. Yeah. yeah it's, as long as you don't bust her, he's not going nowhere. Right. He, he's there. So, you know, that is another stage. That I love to hunt that way, but I've I've got away from it in the last few years because it's almost impossible to film yeah. uh, by yourself. Yeah. Uh, if you had a camera guy, we'd be a little different. But uh, So I like to just find them bottles, necks, and pinch points and just sit on him and wait on him. Yeah. When, when the days, like I, we made a comment today, I like to hunt the day of the rut and the two days after Seems like when that front comes through and the temperature drops at double digits, drop ten degrees or more, they're gonna be up on their feet. Yeah. That's now that's you you mentioned the the sign you look at the the rubs, uh, you know what you're looking at there, scrapes, tracks, all that. 
do you look for a place and then the sign for the place or do you go look for sign and then try to find a place uh, I, 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 tr I try finding a sign first to to see if I think there's a quality deer I want to hunt in there uh, and a lot of times we hunt some meat that's why we go to the Midwest we know what's there and I'm, I'm so. curious <laughs> that, because the bouncing around is talking that's kind of talking my language where most of the places we hunt and especially the places we're successful are places we've never been before we go in blind a lot uh, we prefer to yeah and we do really well doing that and rather it sounds like you have a lot more of a plan like with feed trees and you're checking feed trees and you're you're moving around based on that plan and what the sign kind of brings to you right and that's we, and that's early season like come yeah, right, and throw moving that stuff into out the, the window the it's, rut, it's over with yeah we continually hunt like those crossings those close um the bottlenecks two peninsulas in a swamp getting closer to each other than the rest of the swamp is we look for the place and confirm it with the sign that all all i want is a confirmation I, i'm i'm going to that place that i found through a satellite image somewhere and i'm going there and all i want is a single confirmation I, if i can find one big track i'm good uh, that, but i thought i thought you were more talking about a place when i look at a place you're talking about it where am i going to climb you you mm -hmm. when i well that to... that's kind of what what i'm getting at do you go look do you find that place and then look for your sign no 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 i look for the sign it's just like Jonathan talking about i'm looking for that fresh sign around that tree and then i'm finna climb then i'm looking for the, which side of the wind can i get on to have the advantage for the wind uh, but now i want to find the sign first you know very seldom will i go in blind and just climb i got uh, you. you know it, it's I ain't gonna say I hadn't done it before and hadn't killed deer like that, but that's mm -hmm. you're not very highly successful doing that. Yeah. You just you that's, you get lucky, like say a blind hog find another every once in a while. That's so, right. That's right. So that's why you try to be in the woods as much as you that's can. Right. You never know. <laughs> and see, that's how that's how we kill the majority of the deer we kill is going in blind and never having been there before. Well, well I go in a lot of places I've never been there before, but I'm but you're looking for that sign, sign before I climb a tree. Right. Yeah. I'm not. I'm not finna waste a half a day up a tree the rest of the evening yeah, without I'm finding some, something I'm, I'm confident. In. One confirmation that of fresh sign in that place that I've already picked the place, the area I'm yeah. going, and I'm just looking for a confirmation of a spot within that area that I'm going to jump up in the dark. Uh, that yeah. We do, we do better in the mornings going in blind. And usually that later morning. Um, so do you guys do a lot of a lot of e scouting? A lot of uh, yes. So yeah. <clears throat> I particularly don't do. Uh, I, I like to look at my maps and all, but but a lot of the areas in the south where we hunt, it's so thick. I mean, yeah, you the only thing I use them for is a starting point exactly, to get me into it. Exactly, area. you got you can pick some funnels out. You yeah. can use this lake or this yeah. slough or whatever. But we're down in the south where we are. Man, you gotta, you gotta. You it's gotta just so big and broad. Yeah, it's, 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 it's you, you gotta know, put do, boots on the ground. We do a lot of you boots gotta. on the ground scouting, but not, not to go scout. We we don't make many trips to scout anymore. We used to. We used to cover a lot of ground, and we didn't do as well as we did jumping in blind in the dark. But we will scout from one place to the next. So we'll hunt, we'll go in blind in the morning, and a lot of times we do well. If we don't, we jump down, and we may cover a mile or two, and we will try to pick the farthest point we can that we feel like we can make it to and cover that ground in between, and then we come. We may come back to that next weekend. It's something we passed in between that looked good, or we may come back to it next year, but we'll – We'll mark that, you know, on X or <clears throat> Lord knows how many we, you know, how many marks we have on on X. Uh, things we, thank you, sir. Things we find that uh, are, are interesting along the way, but we've almost quit going into uh, for the purpose of scouting. 
walking into areas mm -hmm. beforehand. But, but that's a lot of my joy is getting out and covering new ground and and seeing yeah. that. That's, that's part yeah. of the yeah. I get excited just like man. What's around the next corner? Yeah, it's, it's, I love it, that. Man. It's, it's sort of yeah. about like yeah, you know, I don't know if y'all ever trout before. When I was a kid, I used to trout a lot. It's like setting that set, yep. and you're ready to get back next day and see what's there. I'm 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 walking is like I'm, I'm making this set. I, yep. I, I want to see what's out there. Yep, that's. Yeah. For, for me, that's that's that's, just, that's and for me that's that's some man. of the most important it's, it's, part of the process. Yeah, is, 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 it is, know, and especially uh, when you find something new and you're just like, oh yeah, I, it's I, just I, it's, I, that, I, it's I, that fire, and man, it, it lights that fire. I have thought about it before with this YouTube channel, man, just just go scout places and say, hey, I'll sell you a waypoint. It's just it's just hey. hit the ground and, <laughs> yeah. and find stuff like it. Yeah, guys you know, that, that's funny. You thought that. I thought that too. I would probably <laughs> yeah. make some money if I if I sold yeah. some of my waypoints. But I've, I've thought about selling them once I get too old to walk that far, just selling them all off. I'm talking can. about doing it fresh. Is just go hit the yeah. Midwest and say, hey, yeah. hey I'll pre scout for you. Hey, yeah. You know what's funny? There's guys that do this fishing wise. There's okay. a lot of guys that sell pins fishing. I bass okay. fishing. Yeah, Cause, cause I, I love doing that. That's just the side of it. I love yeah. doing. It's like. But I tell you what, if uh, I find Nick, that, if I find that 150 inch deer, or whatever, I ain't selling that deer. <laughs> no, I'm not. I don't care. I want that deer, man. I I was talking with someone earlier, and I was talking about you know being able to put somebody on a deer, uh -huh. and then go in there and instantly have success. Yeah. That, to me, you know, it, it, I get. A, a, a joy well, out of that. You got the satisfaction. I, you if, found for, it. For, to make that, I'm, I, you know, to make that happen, I, I, it, I, I'm not I'm not that guy that has to kill all those deer. Well, older you but get. But for somebody else to to enjoy it and, and to be just take just and, and, and set them on fire, oh, that, yeah. that mm -hmm. to me so, is it, it's, it's just as much as me killing it. Yeah, so Scott did this to his buddy. Uh, he put his buddy in a spot. He's a listener to the podcast, buddy of ours, Nick Harris. Yeah, uh, this is early on. How, how long ago was that when uh, when the the, uh, the, the one sixty eight he killed in Alabama? That was uh, the 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 first when we first met. Mm -hmm. I I killed a big nine on January first at like one thirty in the afternoon, and I killed a big ten the next morning. At like eight o'clock, well, it was cold, and I had both of them it, it, in our little subdivision. I had both of them in my driveway, a mm -hmm. receiver, you know, in the back of my truck, just redneck Alabama ass. <laughs> 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 the neighborhood loved me, you know. <laughs> well, Nick comes by one day, and he just like looks, and he's just like, comes by the next day, and he stops and backs up. We had never met, you yeah. know. Pulls up in the driveway. We just hit off, start talking. He, he he's just like what? And he, he's you know sinking four or five grand in the leases every year. And he's just like, you killed on the mansion here? I'm like, mm-hmm, <laughs> seventeen dollars. <you know? laughs> so, you know, he's like, well, you take me, and show me some stuff. I said, I'll take you. You know, I'm that guy. Mm -hmm. I, I'll take you and I'll show you. Get in this tree. And 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 get ready, you know. Uh, so, sure, we you know we hashed this out before. We'll talk um, about it again. That, yeah, yeah, yeah. We uh, so you know I take him and put him in a tree, and uh, uh, he he sees a it's about a thirteen fourteen inch seven point. He calls me. He said, "I just saw you know." Wait, I said no, no, no. You know, we're talking width wise, thirteen, fourteen inches wide, not yeah. total antlers. But yeah, no, 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 no. Yeah, yeah, the, the thirteen, fourteen inches wide, two and a half year old, mm -hmm. seven point. And uh, he's mm -hmm. like, "What?" You know, and I said, "No, man. You know, bucks are on their feet. Just sit tight, sit tight. It's it's early, you know." And uh, a little bit later, there's two does come down by me, and there, there's an, there's another buck come out, and and it's like he wasn't even following him he was just like watching him just kind of but trailing they go on down towards nick he's 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 about 250 yards from me and uh 30 minutes later ka -toom, you know, I'm like, and then he calls me he's like Man, there's there's two big bucks come chase there was two bucks chasing this one dove mm -hmm. come up they come up in the uh select cut pines up in the vines and stuff you can see, you know, 
200 yards, but they're, they're fine. They're just, it's, there's a lot of growth in there. He said, they both ran out there. They all stopped. He said, uh, one of them was about a, it was about a 140, 145 class eight. And uh, he, said, I, he said, I got on him, shot, boom, just disappeared. It, it, you know, shoot seven mag, kind of rolls your back a little bit. <laughs> Deer's gone. And uh, he jacks another round, he's trying to see what's going on, sees the doe, doe goes off the hill, and he looks, buck's still standing there. Well, it was the big one. He shot the smaller of the two, and it was a probably a 125, 130 class buck. But uh, anyway, I was tickled to death for him, yeah. man. You know, I, t I took him out, showed him, you know, the place, and but he was hooked. And now, still to this day, they're still dropping money on leases. But his 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 passion is out there on the management area, where it's hard. Where it, it's it's not sitting in a shooting house on a on a green patch or on a corn pile. You yeah. know? Well, I take in showing this other place, <laughs> and uh, opening day, gun season slips in there. He knows how to hunt. You know, he 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 knows how to hunt. His daddy raised him right. Um, he goes in what we call the shoe boxes off a little bit to the right. And another hollow to the left, and it, 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 it's so tight in there. That's why we call it shoebox. I mean, you're literally sitting up. This these SMZs are just kind of deep drains. You're literally like all morning long, <laughs> just, just like <laughs> watch, watching the strain. Well, lo and behold, he sees some, and, and you can't even you can't shoot a long distance. It is gun hunting. But he ended up killing the deer at like 15 yards. Um, see some legs coming down, and the next thing you know, he see tines and comes on down just right in front of him. Boom. I think he had to I, – I, he shot him, killed him on the first shot, but he ran up the hill and stopped, and he shot him again. Yeah, it was a 17 point, scored 168, you know. The next – Just a small deer. <laughs> <laughs> the next – yeah, the next year opening. This is today. Alabama, by the way, too. Yeah, yeah the way he Alabama casually talked about the 140 <laughs> makes me suddenly feel like I'm a kid at the adult table. <laughs> 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 Where, like, a 120 is a trophy where we're, we're at. Yeah, hey, we're from North Mississippi. We know we where you're talking about. Right. Well, so, hey, let, like, let me like tell we you, so I like how he kind of put down the 120. It was just a. Yeah. So, so I'll say this: Scott has been the biggest influence. Well, Scott and Nick, his buddy, he's talking about right now, has been the biggest influence on me passing deer. And you have I, to, I, man. You have to. When like, it when it is right, it is it is vital. If you want to kill a trophy buck, and when it gets right there, you the day before I killed the wizard, mm -hmm. I passed six rack bucks. And I almost, I, I was, I had, I flipped the safety off and was about to shoot an eight that was 15, 16 inches wide. And he came up the hill chasing a doe and he got about 50 yards from me. And I'm like, you know, it's, it's quarter to 11. I'm like, I could get my truck to there and load him up right there. And I was just like, don't, because I saw, I saw one about nine o'clock that was just a giant and I couldn't get on him. Well, uh, it's that restraint. And I went back the next morning, same spot. I talked to Alan. I was like, I don't know what I'll do. You know, was like, he said, go back there. Go back. And I was like, okay. So, go back the next morning, 6.55. The wizard steps out. You know, first deer I see. Boom, dead. Which is a notorious buck on the podcast. L long time yeah. listeners know about that. Deer. Yeah, I mean, yeah. It wasn't like it's some big, great I – mean, I had him scored today. He was 142, but he's 13 inches wide. I mean, dude, know, he's tight. Freak. Yeah. yeah. Freak over yeah. there. Yeah. Uh, yeah, his G2s are right he's 14, a main, 14 inches long. Main he's, frame eight point. He's just a, yeah, he's a main he's eight. He's a big eight. He's yeah. like little Higgers. I mean, crazy left, deer. Left beam's 27 and uh, right beam's 25. Dang, G2s Alabama. on the have back some, dude. Have some beans and times there now. G2s, you know. One's thirteen and a half. One's almost fourteen. You know, yeah. just just a freak 
deer. Yeah. Um, but anyway, that being said, to to pull somebody into those moments and have them get inspired to hunt public, he, he I mean, he'll go and he'll hunt his lease and he'll take his kids, take his wife, let them kill a deer, but his heart is on that daggone management area now because he knows – it's a test. It's 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 hard. It's 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 not easy, you know. And that's what we all like about what we do. Yeah. It's, it's oh, not yeah, easy. For sure. And that's why you get so satisfied with like. It's not like look what I've done, but it's 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 in you. Yep. You're just like. This is what we're living for. It's what we're all living for. And I don't know about y'all, but. It- just an encounters a win. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I. Oh God, dog. I can tell you <laughs> yeah. something. Oh God. You got to get Scott God. fired up. <laughs> no, I mean, I mean, we were blessed. You know, yeah. starting there on on the mansion area where there was literally world class deer, and they're still there, but world class deer. You know, Jeremy's Scott, taking notes. We went in today. Uh, that's what I'm saying. We went in today. Jeremy was listening what, real close. What, what, what WMA are you I'll, talking I'll, about? I'll, <laughs> you let me know when you want to come get in that tree. Oh, <laughs> I, I, I like that end of or, you know, right in January. I'm oh, open there now. We yeah, got the first year. This is mid January. Oh, or yeah. mid, uh, mid December. No, it's a December uh, hunt. I'm gonna, oh, yeah, December. I'm going to tell you I'm going to come. Uh, Just, <laughs> we don't. We don't have deer like this where I'm at. I want to come. Well, you all need to come because. It's going away, and I'm just yeah, you know, yeah. That's why I crappie fish so much. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. so I got a question for Jeremy. He's he's a big rut mm-hmm. hunter. Um, what what's your stance on calling and, and all of the states you go? That is it depend on what state you're in. Uh, There's no doubt it works a lot better than well. You got to have buck to doe ratio. The more bucks there, the better it'll work. Yeah. Calling? No doubt. Is that what you said? Yeah, calling. calling. Oh yeah. And yeah. and that priest rut mm-hmm. when they're sort of getting that dominance. Uh, for they really yeah chasing does it will work yeah it will work uh down the south i have rattled a few in but not really anything big in mississippi uh i, I think it's a lot like turkey hunting you find that right one yeah it'll work yeah and that in a short situation yeah but it definitely works a lot better in the midwest yeah that's kind of my experience i've, I've been to iowa once i've been to kansas and, and and like i tell people that i still don't know why they call that deer the same white-tailed deer we hunt because it's a different animal. <laughs> it that is. That sucker, he, 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 that deer acts like them TV deer. You watch, Alabama, you, Alabama. You watch the jury boys rattle and grunting and carrying on. Hey, I, we, when I grew up as a kid, I, I always watched that thing. Alabama, we call that a stuff lot of fly deer. down here. <laughs> no, 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 can yep. can call that bark's pretty good. Yeah, I, I, no, I, I, I do do it a lot. Yeah, I've grown call. it yeah. several times, and yeah. it seemed like a few minutes later, one shows up. Yeah, I don't yeah. know if he come to it or yeah. if he was just still well, coming. Nah, I, there, I definitely don't it, leave. It, 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 it happens too often with a can call. It's yeah. just like when you hear, you hear it comes, it's like, oh, come on. Yeah, yeah I've grown yeah. a lot of deer in the south, a lot of deer, and I, and I don't like to. I don't like to grunt in the blind. I like to I like to have my eyes on that deer when you I make him. that grunt. That way I can read his body language. I can I can watch how he's reacting when I respond yeah. to him or grunt to him, see what he's gonna do. But I've had a lot of success grunting deer in the south, but rattling I don't Yeah. I've rattled in a few, but not Yeah. Not many. Not many. I've never rattled in a buck, but I've rattled in six or seven does with a buck behind her yeah she will come to it mm. to try to lose him in the fight that's odd i don't i've never seen that before that <laughs> them saltwater deer different over there <laughs> right now hey <laughs> I've, I've, I've brought <laughs> like a buck chasing a doe and she's heading away from me i've rattled and brought six or seven now into me and she will come looking for the fight to lose that buck that's pestering her I think ours is a little different. They want she's wait want away from bucks. So yeah. she's she's yeah. Uh, so now I, I have killed bucks and found good bucks. You hear a doe blowing. Yeah. You know, early in the morning you hear her blowing, you're like, Man, my wind's not blowing that way. And a little bit later you hear her blowing again and you're like you know, there'd be a buck messing with her. Yeah. And she she'll be blowing. I've heard that done that several times. Heard. And I have blowed like you know, to do that distress blow. Yeah. It won before. You know, a lot of times they'll Jeremy, 
Give me a good blow. Give me, give, give me uh, that sounded wrong. So give, give, me, give, 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 give me, give me, give me a double. Oh, now you did. Double blow. Oh. No. <laughs> <laughs> that would probably be edited out for sure. Yeah. No doubt about that. Oh, oh you drink you another, Jacob? Yeah. Y'all, no, I'm just, I'm, I'm, y'all better not edit that out. I'd say to leave it in, dude. Uh, Whatever. Oh, there's Got a lot of times when I bump I, a deer. I, I want to see him do it. I'll blow. Is, yeah. Because then I think, like, you know, a deer hears one and it, it's, they'll think, well, that was a deer. Especially if I know the wind wasn't blowing straight to them. Yeah. <laughs> and they'll run off. Yeah. I, and I, I've, I've had a deer, come, a buck come back to me doing that before. Really? Mm-hmm. Just, he's nosy. Yeah. He, he, he just won't know what it was. Have y'all ever had uh, success snort wheezing at all? Thank you. Snort wheezing. Have y'all had success ever using snort wheeze? I, Not I, at all. I have um, definitely in the, in the Midwest when I've been up there. Kansas and – and Iowa, uh, down south, they're just not that folk. Not so much, yeah, so you know. I, and I've had I've had weird situations happen. And, and actually, we were talking about rattling earlier, and this hunt always sticks out in my mind because it's one of the few times I've had rattling actually rattling work for me. Um, I'm a big traditional hunter. I like my recurves, long bows. And one year, I decided I was going to try to build my own bow, and and try to kill a deer with a self bow oh, okay. and and i actually the only deer that i've killed with self bow because i don't really see myself going down that route a whole lot that's a <laughs> that's a tedious process you want to go making and, your own arrows yeah. and napping so, your own heads and not that far i haven't that <laughs> head. Yeah, there's a lot there's a lot of guys out there that do and that, yeah. that's wearing some buckskin <laughs> yeah that's that's taking it to the extreme level there yeah. um but uh the only deer i killed myself by rattle in and uh, he come in, and I was, you know, so that's, that's one of the cool. exceptions where it's, it's actually worked some in the south. But yes. um, I wanted to ask you, there was a gentleman uh, I was talking with, the guys from Indiana mm-hmm. today. Um, somehow we got on, he was like, because we got to talking about feed trees and stuff. And, um, he, he got to ask me about uh, drought, which I, I know you being in the swamp and those, and those bottomlands, I'm sure at some point you get into drought situations. Um, he 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 asked me, he was like, how did, when you have droughts, how do you deal with that, and how does it affect? Well, I want to say it was 2016, 2017, and maybe 2019. We were just we hit- dead bone dry, yeah. like so rain a good bit in the, in the spring. So I can up relate until- to that. Oh. And and the white oaks just had massive uh, acres, really, just m- massive drops. And 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 I was I was wondering if you've ever experienced that. So it's almost like they go into shocks, like, oh hell, we're all gonna die. <laughs> and they drop. cast our babies. It seemed you know? like they seemed like they dropped early that year. That was a year we had some ninety degrees in October. Now what year? Then. What year was this? Like there was there was like two six sixteen was it sixteen seventeen it was like hundred degrees first day October nineteen I remember was it nineteen was it ninety eight have y'all se- have y'all seen that that's my yeah. question to the group when these trees almost go into shock that they don't throw just a just dump acorns which is kind of the opposite you know everybody's always saying uh, you know you got to have a good a lot of rain during the year to produce acorns. I've seen times where there was more acorns in a drought year. I guess that's what I'm saying in a mm-hmm. nutshell. Have you ever well, seen that? Well, I think it pertains to what species of acorn it is. If it's a white yeah, oak. Yeah, see, this is white oak. Okay, you know? so so I don't know a whole lot about white oaks. All right, and they're also they're tap rooted into drains, which yeah, the drain is still going to stay somewhat wet down under. Yeah. But it's dry as a bone on the surface. So what I do know is a, a white oak is on a one-year cycle. Yeah, it takes one-year right. mature. A red yeah, oak's, I've seen them a red two. oak's two year. Oh, well, I've seen whites on on two. I mean, they will drop. Well, no, no. What he's saying, it takes that acre in two years to mature on a red oak. Right. So what? Yeah. So like so yeah. so what I've noticed with with it's it's red oak's two years, white oak's one year. I try to keep up with this. <clears throat> so we get down a whole nother yeah this that but I, i've seen white oaks on that two-year cycle too when they're hot well when it's really good well i think we're, i think you're misunderstanding what, what 
Yeah. I'm saying I think you're seeing like I think you're you're talking about maybe that white oak not producing for two years or whatever. But what I'm trying to say is so the red oak life cycle, that acre takes two years to produce to, to maturity. Okay. So a lot of times if so for instance, we're in twenty three right now. Last year if we had a rough spring, had a late frost, mm. the acorns that are affected are this year. So it 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 kind of goes back a year on that red oak. So, and in, in my area, that's what we're hunting red oak. That nut all tree, that's that's a red oak. Yeah. So, if if we have a if we have a late frost, last we got year one this, we it, got might, one it might affect year. everybody. everybody I'm wondering year. what it's gonna do. Yeah. Because they were already starting to bud out and everything, and they just got. Yeah, they got hammered. What, what? Got hammered. Yeah, they, yeah. It, they it, got it froze up. What April? So it was, was late it April. April. Was it late April? Yeah, like, it warmed I up. Mean, warmed up. Everything hard leaves out. Freeze. <clears throat> and you know they'd already started produce those little. I call them little wormy, the little things where they're starting to. You yeah, know, before they're bringing their leaves mm -hmm. on, and even the leaves that had started, they just turned brown and and died. It like that, they just turned brown, and then they'd like start it over. Yeah, yeah. I was I was wondering, you know, things like that. That's my kind of question. Well, so well, last but, year, but I have seen, and it may have been something that I missed prior in the year, but that some of the the best acorn crops I've seen were in drought periods. Yeah, and a lot it of times seems that, that, so <clears throat> opposite of what you would think. Well, a lot of times that acorn growing in the springtime. Mm -hmm. A lot of times we get that drought you're talking about's in the summer. Most of the time, it's going to go ahead and make it. But I think what Johnson was talking about, like the red oak and white oaks, like some years you have red oak crop, I mean a white oak acorn crop, no red oaks. Well, the next year you're going to have a red oak. Yeah. That's that's, yeah. that's what I've learned. Too, yeah, our, our red oaks drop year in, year out. They rain acorns. Sometimes the deer pick them up. Sometimes they don't. Well, the, that, well, the deer definitely doesn't prefer the red oak over the white oak. But it, like in my particular area, we don't have white oaks. Right. So all they have is the red oak. They're going to eat that. They're going to hit that red oak like they would a white oak in the north. Yeah. Most of the deer hunters nationwide will tell you they prefer that white oak over the red oak because the white oak is less acidic mm -hmm. than than that than that red oak. We have a lot of white oaks, but they're when they so there's one area or one management area that I I know of that they drop it may be like three years it may be six years in between them dropping and a lot like big big mature white oaks might drop 10 acorns hmm. and then there's some other areas they just pour but they're it's random sporadic on what they do when and that's going to be your feed trees that's going to be yeah, and that's I've my seen, experience when I'm looking for new because I have to look for new ones because they get cut and cut and you know it, it's it's that's the thing that I'm always having to look for new new my new trip my new trees you know yeah. making my circuit in the, I, I do September you do August we open in October you open in September mm -hmm. that's kind of what we were talking about the other night but I, I'll, I'll hit my 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 go-to trees um, but now I've got to find new go-to trees, uh, which is good. I, you know, it expands me out. Um, but uh, it, it, you're still going to have those those certain trees that are going to be the hot tree. That, it's kind of our, our what you know what our topic is. The, the hot tree is different than a, a, a SMZ bottom where there's. 40 white oaks and there's two of them that's hot mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's and we see so that particular management area unfortunately it's usually before they really drop but though there's one spot i know of a couple tree and they almost always drop a couple acorn and i'll see deer come search for them mm -hmm. to see if they're there yeah though They'll swing up from the swamp, come up the hill, and check those three trees, and then 
move on down. Mm-hmm. They'll go back down the hill and back in the swamp. Yeah. And the, um, the, and that particular place, it's kind of simple on the feed tree because there's those three white oaks. But where most of our areas, if you've got one, you've got a thousand. And if one's dropping, the other 999 are yeah, too. Yeah, that, that, that definitely makes it tough when it's it, like that. Yeah. yeah. Not to, I mean, I, I want to change it. Not that I want to change the subject, but there's a there's a topic I really wanted you guys to touch on, and then Jeremy, I'm gonna pitch it to you because you, I think you and Jonathan are very similar. I want to talk about lunar phase and, and lunar position. Okay, this is a conversation that is highly debated. The funny thing is, some of the more successful hunters I know truly pay attention to this. Some of them don't. Some of them do, and the ones that do seem to see a very close correlation with moon positioning and buck movement. And Jonathan, in your uh, I'm going to let Jeremy take it over, but Jonathan, in your seminar today, you talked about, especially early season, how powerful it can be on feed trees. But, Jeremy, I want you to kind of kick us off. What is your understanding, your take, and how long have you been paying attention to the lunar phase, but also mostly the positioning aspect, and some of your personal thoughts and uh, just experience really pay attention in, in the correlation with deer movement? You know, I, I pay a lot of attention to it. You know, what I say is when it's straight up overhead and when it's, underfoot that's your major time and that's a generally a two to three hour move time the minor is when it's coming up when it's rising and when it's setting and that's generally a less an hour and a half or so hour but i pay attention to that especially when it gets in the morning when it falls or in the evening but now when you get a full moon and that full moon is up in the middle of you know, or, or it was up in the middle of the night and it's straight under your feet i guarantee when you killed that deer it was straight under on that full moon night, it seemed like what they do, they move all at night, but that, that 12 hour, 11 and a half, 12 hours later, they're going to move in the middle of the day. I, I pay a lot of attention to it. I'm just, I'm just telling you, if you don't believe me, if you run cell cameras, when you start seeing pictures of them at night, daytime, look at that moon chart. And not, not 100% of the time, but I'm going to guarantee you, way over 50% of the time, they're going to be on that major amount of time. Mm-hmm. I'll uh, tell you this. So right before we started this podcast, Hunter Hogan texted me earlier. Y'all had him talking earlier, mm-hmm. and uh, Hunter's big on the on the moon phase. We're sitting around here doing a podcast right now. He's out there scouting for deer right now because it's a red moon day. Like, he's, he's a big believer in it. And um, I tell people this. I don't try to plan my hunts based on the lunar table. I want to hunt as much as I can whenever I can. But like Jeremy said, you know, those days where where everything kind of lines up uh, that particular day i killed killed that deer at 12 30. It, it was right on the money just just like one day off but it, it was it was right there um you know i can go back bucks i've killed in the past and about 75 percent of them are going to be pretty dead going close to that to that major time whether that moon's overfoot underfoot and you know yeah, you definitely want to pay attention to it because yeah. it, you know if you know you're a guy that you've got, say you've only got two weeks vacation, and you need to plan those two weeks. Um, probably want to try to plan it when that when that lunar table is going to be going to be prime for you. Um, so I, I definitely I don't 100 percent go by it, but I definitely I definitely think there's something to it. I did when when. When it's in that full moon, new moon phase, to me, and this is my take on it, whatever, take whatever from it, get up in the morning, right before daylight, chill, drink my coffee, eat a big old breakfast, get my butt in the woods about 7.30 or 8 o'clock, and I'm there till dark, and come what may, you know, that's, that's, that way, I'm I'm there. I slip in, you know. It's daylight, and stay till dark. That's what I do, you know. And usually, there's so much that can happen in midday, especially with the managing area, because you got all these guys that are sitting till nine thirty, coming out mid yeah, midday. Cause they're coming out. You're using foot traffic, truck traffic, you know. 
there's so many variables there in the in the hunting you know like kind of our little tight spots with truck you know running down the road but what at midday one o'clock there is so much that can happen that if you're not there in the middle of the day we watch it pretty religiously on the feeding period times which which correlate right to the moon times we watch it we don't i mean we're gonna hunt if we got time to hunt we don't not go because it's not great however we time some of our hunts on the islands versus the tides we're not going to go booger up that spot that we want to go if we have to be out by 10 in the morning and the majors have it like starts at 9 45 yeah. we're going to wait till next weekend or the weekend after to go hit it um and we'll go hunt somewhere else we can we don't have to worry about the ties we'll go hit the refuge that's open or something like that instead but i follow it definitely every day i hunt i watch it and within maybe five minutes and i actually follow like i think i've got six or seven different apps i follow for the the feeding period times based on um lat long position where you're at and moon over moon under and um 90 degrees they almost all correlate uh, real close in time and within five to ten minutes of it starting you'll hear the birds come out start chirping the squirrels will come out yeah like you, the, the, the birds oh yeah, yes yeah. some funny how the stuff. birds and it, come alive i mean like, okay something's now, fixing to happen yeah yeah, yeah most just time because that feeding period is happening doesn't mean you pick the right inactive. spot for the day and you're you're in the deer but you definitely can tell it's happening you, oh, yeah. you you know it's firing off well my probably the last three years i've been very fortunate i got to hunt pretty much from the middle of october to the end of January, and you start getting to hunt three months straight, you really pay attention start to the movement. I, they, I think they still squirrel move. It's bark, just, squirrel yeah. barking, and you're like, okay, there's something. There's yeah, something, yeah. But you, you, you pay attention right to that there. moon, and you see, all right, we're on a full moon. Or, you know, I always say, if I could time the rut, I want the full moon, that, that three or four or five days right after the full moon, just kill a buck in the morning. Because a lot of times those feminine. I look at it, it's, it's a lot easier to kill that sucker in the morning, pack him out, and get all our stuff out instead of kill him right at dark. Oh, and, and a lot of times, you, you, Will, me and Daniel both are like, man, here, here's a few days to do it. You know, if we get the weather, because I, I got three factors I look at. I look at the rut, I look at the weather, and I look at the moon phase. When I got all three of them, because the moon phase, you got two, you got a major and minor every day. Every day there's a major and minor. It changes, though. But like that full moon, you got three times, because it's early in the morning, midday, and it's late in the evening. You know, I think that's why all moon charts say, hey, that's the best day. There's three moon times that day. Mm -hmm. And then in the daylight hour, even on the short days in the sun, in the wintertime. So I'm just telling you, being able to hunt that much here lately, you really learn a lot from that. And, and new moon, I don't like a new moon. And, and you know, and that, that's pretty much the same as a full. You know, it's in the position of the sky. But I don't think it's as bright at night. You don't get as near as much movement at night. And it sort of messes that midday movement up. Um, I had a camera in Arkansas a couple of years and got a picture of a big deer the same day. The where, next year where, on the where, scrape. Where like, was that at? <laughs> <laughs> hey, it, was, it was close to you, so you don't want me to give it away. <laughs> well, this deer's dead. Now. Yeah, he's, he's dead oh, now. Oh, y'all got that one. No, we didn't get him. No, we didn't get him, but he did. did. Oh, okay. But, but got a picture of him, and it, and it was Thanksgiving. It was a week of Thanksgiving. It was Thanksgiving day. Begging. Yeah, he was a big, but I got him when he was like a three and a half year old first, and he was probably in the 140, 150, just super tall, just one of them stack. The next year, the same full moon, not the same date, but the same full moon at Thanksgiving, he was at the same scrape, midday. Well, I put a camera on the third year. He didn't show up third year, but I got a picture of him in a, in a different spot down in the bottom. Well, he was killed the next year. But it, it, it amazed me how that deer come into that one spot, middle of day to yeah. that scrape. Two years in a row. Yeah, that's pretty interesting. Yeah. I, I, Do y'all see any correlation between temperature and not so much early morning, late evening activity, but 
like full moons, middle of the day, and higher heat. Like I just I checked the temperature back home right now. It's almost eighty degrees right now. Yeah, one thing I hadn't Ooh, heard nobody nobody in this panel talk about barometric pressure. Yeah, ever since this whole time we've been here, just like, oh, yeah. just like high pressure, high barometric pressure day, high pressure. That's, uh, that's you right. You get that that thirty, thir- but not too sky. high though. It can get too Let high. Let it rip, Jack. But but it's, see that, that high pressure always falls. Usually starts rising and settles after that front. You know, because we got a low pressure front come through, it drops. Yeah. Well, when it gets clear that next day, that bluebird day, that pressure's rising. Yes. That's, I, that's key. I've had several it folks that I really respect. I've run into over the years, and they'll say that thirty point oh one. Very much pressure. Mm-hmm. See it. That is yeah. that is that, that. It's funny you bring that up because <laughs> so, that is one of the one of the things we hadn't talked about. Yeah, that's what you know, on the panel. You get that we said blur, the other day. Nobody said sky, anything about that. Cold yeah. front mm-hmm. wind turns out of the northwest, yeah. and all of a sudden, boom! It, and I think stuff's fixing to go so down. That, yeah. For that high pressure, it turns on. For us being on the coast, like we get a hurricane come. And our hurricane season is during the fall, like the heavy season. Middle of rut, bucks chasing does everywhere, just absolutely off the chain activity. That day before the hurricane comes, and that it's rolling pair, in, it's dropping. Like you threw a light switch, yeah, and it's twenty. Just cut some. Mark your calendar, because all those does that came into heat and it's going, it's firing off. They come back into heat 28 days later, and it shut them off. That drop in barometric pressure just absolutely shuts them down. And 28 days from then, it is back on again. So mark it on the calendar. Make sure you're back. But it is gone for 28 days, and they are all gone. And those are um, some of the best years. If the hurricane doesn't tear up the woods and screw it all up, (laughs) it uh, – if it doesn't just absolutely destroy everything, those are some of the best years that happen for us because it shut them all down, and 28 days later they are coming back. I'm really curious, uh, like Jeremy, I, I kind of want to start with you. When it comes to stuff like moon phase and barometric pressure, how did you actually get interested in that and kind of start building your your theories or, or your practices based on that stuff? Well, it's just like experience, being able to hunt that much, and then you run into somebody and they say barometric pressure, and then maybe a year or two later you hear somebody else say barometric pressure, and you're like, ooh, I ain't thought about that. It's a lot of it, I've heard it from somebody, but it wasn't really exact science. You didn't really understand, you know, I didn't understand it. But, you know, like I said, we run into a few guys, that's, that's what I really love about traveling, like we were talking about scenarios, yeah. areas. But when you start running into guys from all different, and because yeah. the moon phase, I think, sort of the same everywhere. Yeah. Barometric pressure, these yeah. fronts and stuff, you, you can start relating from that. Yeah. So th- that's where I started paying attention to it. And, and then I've said before and some stuff, for years there, I kept, a, I kept a log. When I killed a big deer, I wrote it down. I wrote the temperature, I wrote the, the barometric pressure, what the move time was, what, was, what moon phase it was it in. You you keep up with that over the years, and if somebody else killed one, I, I you know I like what time you kill that deer, oh uh, you know and I had to go back and look at the moon face. And I knew what the weather was. I logged a lot of that stuff, and you you'd be surprised how it starts. You know that we got a place over in Arkansas. I guarantee you this holler, Daniel and I both have killed a deer in it. Where is that at? After Thanksgiving. <laughs> after Thanksgiving. <laughs> after Thanksgiving. <laughs> after after, after, after Thanksgiving. You just got to slip <laughs> it. That in first there. front comes through. That. Day that front comes through, the next day after it, I guarantee these bucks gonna come through that sucker. It's just it's like it kind of wipes the, the slate clean, yes. and they're like, yes. That's right. ah, and I can tell you this: I'm gonna with, get up with, on my feet. With, you know? the, yeah. We yeah. talked yeah. about we talked about this earlier. Um, the next day, seeing things and needing to know you got to be in the woods earlier. We were, do y'all do anything around like? residential neighborhoods where deer are prevalent i i don't no I we're, we're country folks we ain't got so, <laughs> i mean like no. do you have like so residential there, neighborhoods where like deer walk around or anything? yeah so there there are actually areas in arkansas that they have what they call urban hunt mm-hmm. and uh in these areas you actually there's actually no limit on these deer you have to get the permit i think you have to go actually take a course and there's there's certain 
spots in Arkansas you can go do this because the deer are they're a nuisance exactly yeah so I, i've never personally hunted them i've got a couple of buddies that they love it because they can go up there and they can just smash <laughs> doe after doe after doe after doe and not burn a tag i've got some places i work in and they're um some of them are island some of them aren't but you can literally rattle deer in with a doritos bag you can shake a bag and they'll come eat them out of your hand um i showed you all some videos earlier feeding them out of the window of the truck yeah. the when you see for us when you see those mature bucks in the middle of the day standing out next to the road you need to be there the next day because it's on the the rut's on and our ruts spread that may be in december that may be in november october yeah. it just it, it's real sporadic and kind of all over the place depending on where you're at but man, when we sit, like we're we're gone, like I'm calling buddies, like it's on, let's go, yeah. you know. But we've got to go this weekend. I just saw them; it's happening, and it, it, that's produced for us over and over again. Where <clears throat> you see multiple mature bucks out in those places where you get to see those deer walking around in the middle of the day in these neighborhoods, but you don't usually see those mature bucks like middle of the day hanging out kind of in main thoroughfares and stuff like that but when it does happen it's on um we repeated i think four mature deer in one year based on that where it happened on a friday the next day we were able to go jump in and get in for like it was almost four weeks in a row I, th I think there was a week or two split in between there where like our rut will come in for like two days at a time and and it, it's all over the place or it may be two solid weeks or it may be split up a couple days here and there i'll it's, tell you what i've learned in this podcast i'm not coming on any saltwater deer <laughs> <laughs> that's for dang sure i'm not going over you need there to come you ain't gotta worry man. about me you, over there buddy i'm not doing that away you gotta come when the tides <laughs> <laughs> you've got to come but, when the tides high. but i will say but, this back back to andrew's question about mm -hmm. learning hey, you were asking jeremy about the barometric pressure on the lunar table you know with the technology we have today if a man really wants to to try to do his own research, he can go back with his trail cam pictures. And you can go back. You can look all this stuff up the record, yeah. years in the past. And you can just go by your trail cam pictures. Well, or pictures. the deer you've killed in the past. They have, I, I've uh, done it on all my the, all of my trail cam pictures. Let me tell you what I do in the summer. Erin, she's sitting back there. She's rolling her eyes right now. Because I just love deer. I love learning what i can about them uh, in my own way and and i'll take every single trail cam picture i have i save every single one every single one of those books doesn't matter daylight night i don't care i want to learn as much as i can i look at the time i go back to the date i look see what the lunar phase was and i and i log all that stuff and then and then i figure out you know, you then you start to see it. You start to see that that the lunar table and the barometric pressure really does have something to it when you start to see these these deer moving in the daylight. And somebody that I gotta I gotta call him out because he kind of inspired me to do this just a couple of years ago is Mr. Warren. That man logs every detail that you can imagine. He has personally showed me his notebooks where he writes all this stuff, every single thing. And he was doing this before we had the technology where we can go back and backtrack now. So we anybody can do it. You can go. You can take all your trail cam pictures that you've had the last ten years, and you can you can look up on the website what the weather patterns were, what the lunar cycle was in the past, and you can come up with your own. Uh, you can come up with your own idea of what of what you what you feel about the lunar table and, and, the, and the barometric pressure and that's that's why i tell folks all the time I, I can based on what i have and what i've studied and what all the the data that i've compiled together i can prove to you that there is there is something to it I, i've got to i've got to say this so penn state just released a deer study 
and in their deer study, and I want to say they were tracking wild deer, but they might not have. Might have been a pen. I, I, I'm not quite sure. I didn't do that much research, unfortunately. But they came out, and this is a study that just got published like two weeks ago, saying that not to jump back from. I don't, I don't know if they studied barometric pressure, but they did study. Uh, they looked at lunar phase, and they said lunar phase. And I don't know if they were talking about lunar position or if it was just lunar phase had zero effect on overall buck movement, or maybe it was just deer movement. Again, mm-hmm. watching the study. But I've heard this happen a couple of times because the reason why I say this is because we'll have listeners message us saying, based off research, there's absolutely zero data that lunar phase, positioning, whatever. I makes. guarantee we'll get messages. Yeah, we'll, get, we'll absolutely yeah. get messages because of that because people stopped listening because they saw that and they instantly had to send us an email on yeah. it. And I'll, I'll, send, I'll forward them to you guys. But um, – They'll say like there's studies out there that show there's zero effect from moon positioning and or phase lunar phase, but again guys like you y'all everyone sitting here and that's kind of talking about this and other guys I know extremely successful, especially hunting pressured whitetails seem to see a uptick in movement especially from mature bucks or and all overall deer as well during those periods that we were talking about, and one thing I just want to put out there to all y'all maybe one of y'all can take it away is why do you think you guys are seeing this, but for whatever reason in the research, they're not seeing that based off however they're tracking that data with GPS collars. One thing I've seen, I've hunted the mountain states a lot, is don't, you know, like Montana, where it's you colder. They're an early, late mover. Don't seem like the moon affects them as much out there. So maybe the further north you get, and especially if they've done that study in the winter time, because mm-hmm. you know, that's the best time for the feed. It starts warming up in the morning, they're going to get up and go they, feed. They and they ag it, feeders? Is that, are they ag feeders there? Or? Uh, no, no, they're going out in the alfalfa fields out west. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah they're, they're going out to that, that high-protein food. Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah but I have seen that in the mountain states. And, you know, like it's cold. You know, yeah. you, you have that zero-degree temperature, and you don't hardly see them real active in the middle of the day on yeah. full moon. Yeah. I, I have noticed that in that part of the country is the only way, but pretty much else I find it, white tail, it works. And it definitely works in the south because we basically got data to prove it to us. Yep. I, I just based it off my own. And like I say, I preach all the time. I, I do not <clears throat> plan my hunts by that, by the lunar cycle, by the, by barometric pressure of the moon. I want to be out there as much as I can. But I have noticed that in some situations that there is, is some matchups, whether that be coincidence or not for my for my own personal no, stuff. It's, hey, it's, I, it, it I is think what it is. It, I think it more revolves around, especially when they – the bucks start to get on their feet pre-rut, starting into the rut. But they're more prone. But, you know, like the deer that I hunt, they're scared. These deer are so pressured and so scared. And they're laying, you know, 100 yards away in a pine thicket. And they they get hungry. Well, there's going to be times where they're, you know, Come 10 o'clock, 12 o'clock, they need to get up wherever it may be. Whenever, when there's not an acorn crop, they're going to hit the honeysuckle. You know, there's stuff to browse, stuff that we ain't even covered as far as what we call feed tree. Well, there's times when we don't have feed trees, but you you still got food source, greenbrier, honeysuckle. All the browse, they're going to get on their feet, and I think, there are times when there's a fine line there where you know they haven't eaten in four hours you know I, moon I, phase and then they're just kind of like i need to get up but with go going back to the, the the barometric pressure i know for sure and i don't know if it's, it's it may be confidence mm-hmm. in me yeah, and it's when it, when that when that high pressure comes in that bluebird sky that wind's starting to pick up you got a front moving in it's, it's just when 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 everything kind of adds up it's just that confidence builder but you know it's kind of like the the scent i got a question for you the guys that don't believe in the lunar tables do they believe in those onyx <laughs> <laughs> I'm just curious. I mean, you know that that's kind of what I'm going with. Just looking like at stuff and saying, "Ah, you're wrong." Well, yeah. where where they're doing those studies, what is the pressure there? What are the deer on? So we have we hunt a 
wide variety of places. We have places in town we hunt. We've got, um, we don't have large ag crops, but we've got some, like, I've got a three acre spot with an, uh, with a four acre ag field next to it with a salt marsh finger that comes up in and the deer are forced across a finger and it, it um, good buddy of mine hooked me up with this little private spot and it works out well. It just, but those deer are daylight and those deer are daylight and dark. The, the deer in town are not even daylight, but right before dark like clockwork every day um you get out on the those islands and there's kids feeding them ice cream at 11 30 in the morning out the side of a golf cart you're not going to find that in the other place what is the what is the parameters around that study where are they doing it and so if i put tracking collars on deer in town and some of the spots i've hunted the lunar cycle has almost zero effect on them. I know exactly where they're bedding. I know exactly where they're walking to. There are shop in the industrial park. I can, we have cameras in the parking lot and I can tell you almost to the hour when those deer, cause I used to hunt not far from there. I can tell you where they're coming from, where they're going to be at what time within probably 15, 20 minutes on a daily cycle. And the lunar cycle doesn't have a whole lot of effect on those deer because human society has pushed those deer into a cycle that all the vehicles leave the industrial park, the doors start slamming. That's when the deer know to come out there. They, they start moving in, they eat all the shrubbery and whatnot out there. So what are the parameters where they're doing those studies? Is, is it in a cage where people come and feed them on a daily basis or you know what is it and i tend to believe it's more towards that i know that based on what i've seen through hunting and seeing the the lunar cycles actually affect deer in a wild scenario versus a a, you know people inducing yeah and that's something we and andrew have brought up before because we've thought the same thing we've had this conversation not even on the podcast but privately talking about a lot of these studies are showing however they're getting their data with the gps caller or gps studies that there's no correlation between lunar phase or lunar position and buck movement or maybe not buck, but just deer movement in general and the thing is that i said the same thing and andrew brought the same thing up as well in the past conversation about like well what's the difference between whether it's a thousand acre pen that they don't get pressured in or a hundred acre pen or even up some private parcel that's maybe just doesn't get pressured the deer can act like deer versus areas where we have induced pressure as well and maybe like there's certain outlying factors like what we're talking about that maybe affect certain populations more so than others based off stress stress levels and everything else that they're dealing with it, it's not even that i mean it, it is that but also even on, in a free range population so we got our hands on gps data that auburn did on a couple of wmas in alabama and i personally went through that data put it on a map stepped through it did all the analysis that's what i do for a living and uh, when we looked at it, one thing that we noticed with the data set, and don't quote me on this, but it it took a, a basically a ping of that deer's location. In the summertime, it was like every hour or so. So you get one pin per hour. In the fall, I think it changed to a higher, that's called your temporal resolution. So it's it's doing one like every 15 or 30 minutes, whatever. And so you're getting just, it's not like a continuous track. Like you turn your tracker on on X, you can see exactly where you walk. That They're not recording that data with these deer. And I think one problem with it is they're not looking at it from a bow hunter's perspective. Like they're not looking at it from a hunter's perspective most of the time. They're researching other stuff. And then this is kind of secondary stuff they're looking at. And they're like, ah, yeah, see, there's not really a correlation. But it's like, well, if you only took one ping in 30 minutes of that deer, and we're talking about the difference between us seeing or killing that deer is him walking 50 extra yards during legal light. Well, they're, they're missing out on that potentially with that data set because the data is too coarse. And that's one problem I have with a lot of those data sets is they're not, they're not tuned to 
to like what a like a bow hunter would need, especially somebody like you, Jonathan, where you're using a freaking long bow, and you know you need them like right there. I mean, it truly is a game of inches. So the the data is not like fine enough to capture that. I think a lot of times there's holes in it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and I, and I would love for a biologist to come on and talk about this stuff. I'd love to talk about the Penn State stuff, um, but like just because people haven't found it yet in and GPS data like doesn't really discourage me, especially when we come to something like the Mobile Hunters Expo and we talk to you guys and all these other people that we talk to and all these people who have a high level of success at a you know and a lot of consistency with it, they all think there's something to it, you know. I don't just discount that. I mean, if if all you guys are seeing the same thing, I do think there's probably something there. And I've gone back and forth on the moon a bunch of times over the years, but it's just something like like Jacob said. We're gonna get emails about it. You know, people people are gonna send us messages. You know, it's like I say, uh, based on my own experience, it's it's not every deer, but it's a lot of them where it just you know. And hey, it just so happened the the largest deer I've killed in my life. It everything was was perfect, know. you know. So maybe there is, maybe there ain't. Hey, mm-hmm. some people believe in those onyx. Other people don't. <laughs> other people don't. So you know, hey, I got teach their, it's teach their yeah. own. I got an example here. A lot of times, rut. You know, some years say, "Man, we had a heavy rut," and some years we don't. I I base that on how the moon falls. You know, generally our ruts pretty much right after Christmas, base first year, December the thirtieth to December the first. But if our full moon falls close to that, it hits right there. But if our full moon falls the fifth, the tenth of December, that's hotter. So I, I, you know, so I, I do think that lunar affects that song. Another thing about that, talking about hit or miss years, our, our buddy Shane Parker talked about this. Mm-hmm. Uh, Andrew, I discussed it a little bit on the episode. I wasn't able, I wasn't able to join, but a lot because a lot of guys say that like, oh man, it's been a bad year, or you have certain guys I've ne- that will say I've never seen good running activity. Come to find out, especially when you're a guy like Shane Parker runs almost 300 trail cameras a year on public land. Sometimes you might just be off the X. And the activity is not where you're at, even though you may see some sign. And his trail camera showed that this year because he was messaging us. Uh, and tell me if I'm am I, am I correct here talking about, as in last year, he thought it was for whatever a weird year. Come to find out when he checked trail cameras, it had shifted where they were rutting really heavy last year. It had shifted to a different area, mm-hmm. not terribly far. I think it was just a few hundred yeah. yards. Well, because he had said that on the podcast. He, he was saying that he thought it was kind of an off year. And we had a lot of people last year that were saying the same thing. And then he ended up pulling more of his camera because, I mean, he literally has like 200 cameras out. Oh, three. He ended up pulling three. some more cameras after season, and he's like, no, it happened on the same days roughly, but it happened like over here in so, this drainage instead of the one he was hunting, and he overlooked this one, which we're going to have him back on to talk about it because we actually ended up getting a bunch of messages about that. Okay. Well, my take on it, we go in, when, in, in the moon phase, back away from the, you know, barometric pressure. It's always been my understanding, um, even even women that are pregnant, full moons, brim, brim, go to bed, more so in a full moon. Dogs, animals will come into heat. Does come into heat, more so, more around a full moon. The doe, we're, we're sitting here talking about, you know, the bucks doing this, the bucks doing that. Well, the bucks, when does start to come in the heat, the bucks are going to get on their feet. It's just a whole nother avenue. It's, it's a whole nother uh, road to go down, you know. That's yep. my take on it. Well, I've always heard I, I, years, you know, years ago, 15, 20 years ago, you say, when's the rut in the Midwest? They say the second full moon after the equinox. Yeah, I've always heard that. The, in, in the, the, the does and start to come in the, the heat. Third full moon in the south. The does start to come in the heat. Well, yeah. they are dictating. Yeah. more so. Oh, completely. The does dictate the rut. Oh yeah. <laughs> it, like, uh, a good buddy of mine says, if his antlers are hard, his pecker's hard. <laughs> <laughs> he's ready to go. The moment the moment he sheds this his velvet, true. he's ready to go. It, the does dictate. The rut coming in, but what I see is a combination of moon, weather, and temperature kicking it off. If you can 
for us that Halloween time, if we can get a full moon come in and right after that, a couple of days within that full moon moving through, you can get a front move through and a cold snap for which for us is dropping that time of year, you know, hopefully a 40 degree morning that, and that's best case. Usually that time period, um, it is full throttle usually. It, I mean, it is just full bore. If we can get that cold to stay for a handful of days, but it will go out with the temperature just like it came in a lot of time. And it, it fires off based on those combination of things coming together. And there's a lot of theories out there for photo period of the day. However, if it was just photo period, it would be on the same exact day every single year, moving, moving forward a quarter of a day until you get to a leap year and it would reset back to the the four or five days prior and it would move forward a quarter of a day every single year but we see it move around so it's more than just the photo period it's several factors that come in that kick them off and i think it, it you've got to get that stuff kind of come together but like i mentioned earlier the i've seen the hurricanes just shut it down with that barometric pressure where it will absolutely stop them, but it stops them all at the same time and they reset and it kind of makes it better in the long run. But we have a real sporadic rut and it's different from one island to the next or across the street from one property to the other. We see differences as much as where they are full blown rut on one side of a creek and haven't even started rubbing or scraping yet on the other side of the creek. Hmm. Interesting. I want to talk about um, some more rut aspect when it comes to actually hunting setup. And Jeremy, I want to throw it to you because I want you and, and Jonathan to kind of go back and forth with this. Talking about rut setups in this river bottom kind of habitat specifically funnels, you know, hunting with just an off wind, cross wind, headwind. I mean, what what is your thoughts? Because I want to get because it's been a while since I've talked to Jonathan about this, and I'm interested in seeing a little bit between y'all similarities, but also maybe differences as well. Because again, this is like the timing of the year that you really go full bore, no matter where you're traveling. You know, you're hunting river bombs, you're hunting kind of that rut period, and kind of traveling with it. What are some of those factors that you're looking for in some of those funnels? And, you know, we kind of mentioned this before in the other podcast, but what are some of those things that you're looking for for setup positionings to funnel those deer down? And I want to see the differences maybe between what you do and similarities or differences between Jonathan. Well, I hunt water a little more than I think Jonathan. I think he hunts these big, big, big hardwood flats. Uh, I, I sort of tend to hang to water and use that as a barrier because it's a natural barrier. It's a... And because most time when we kill a deer we're using another boat most time we're not climbing a tree 100 yards from the boat so so, so I, I i look for that um, <clears throat> you know that is the, probably the key that you know i find signs and stuff and then I, I set up on them barriers or so try to catch them coming through them pinch points another point i want to make on good days versus bad days deer get up every day i think but i think them cool fronts and stuff i heard a guy tell you this several years ago and it made so much sense he may move a quarter mile a day on a good day. He may get up tomorrow and move on the same thing, but he may not move but 100 yards. Look at your odds of difference of catching him moving that, say, a quarter to a half mile compared to 100 yards. You know, he may get up and just move his bed. And But <clears throat> so I, I really, you know, like I said, hunt the weather and hunt bottlenecks for the rut and hunt does. It's, 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 it's my cup of tea. Jonathan, what's your take? Because – this is something, you know, you kind of mentioned earlier in the podcast and even the kind of seminar too, you know, you, you always mention the rut, but like kind of like that sweet spot, so those feed trees early in the season, but you still kind of look at some of those feed trees right before the rut comes in that pre-rut time period. When it comes full, bl- full bore rut in your area, kind of that later November time period, what are some of those factors that you're looking for and how does that change from the feed tree aspect to what you're doing during the rut? Yeah, so, so honestly, if, if, if we make it, in our season, if we make it to the rut, and I haven't 
I haven't killed that that deer yet. I've I've been beat already because I'm with me uh, being a traditional hunter and trying to get him twelve yards. That's that's why I key in on these feed trees so much is because early season I know that feed trees right there. I know where he's going. He, I know where he's going. <laughs> so so that's why that's why I key in on. That's why I'm so focused in on these feed trees early because I know for me my chances decrease at killing that deer if he makes it to the rut it happens all the time i get beat i just i can't ever you know sometimes i get them sometimes i don't so so happened to me last year the particular deer i was on i caught him on and, and last year you, you brought the drought earlier last year we had the largest drought i've ever experienced in in arkansas uh, our river levels were the lowest that i've ever experienced since i've hunted so and it made it extremely extremely tough because there were areas that did not have water that i've never even seen dry land before so it dispersed deer everywhere on top of that we had a terrible terrible acorn crop hardly had any acorns at all last year so it made it extremely tough to try to narrow down for me to try to get a 12 yard shot so the particular deer that I ended up keying in on, the first particular deer that I ended up keying in on early, I actually didn't even know that he existed until about the 4th or 5th of November. I got a picture of it. Well, that was a – I didn't even know that until around the, the 11th or 12th when I checked that trail camera. I had pictures of him on, on a late dropping water oak, and it was a very marginal tree that, that, it, that it had produced, but it wasn't just one of those super hot trees. I had a couple pictures of him on but anyway, so I missed him. I missed him on that when I might have could have killed him on that on that particular tree on that particular food source. It, it done got rut. I had a couple cameras in some funnels, and I caught a couple pictures of him. So when I when I get beat, like I say, I get beat early season. When I'm focusing on the rut, then I'm really trying to find a, a really tight pinch point for me to try to get you know a twelve. 20 yard shot on that deer and just like jeremy he, he he mentioned barrier the water a lot of there is we hunt we do we next to the rivers or sloughs mm -hmm. or something like that and if i can find that really tight pinch point and you know catch that perfect crosswind some guys call it the killing wind you know it's just that off wind where he feels comfortable coming through there where he can he's just off you where he he feels like it's in his favor but then you're just off and you you you, know, you kind of got the edge on him too um so, yeah, when we, when we make it to that that time of year, uh, I'm I'm trying to to pinch him down as close as I can, whether it's between a lake and a slough or a or a thick edge and a river bank or wherever. Um, but that's why it's so tough for me personally because it's really hard to for me to to get that deer narrowed down. And last year, the deer I hunted, he made it to the rut. I saw him three different times. <clears throat> Two times I had him within within 40 yards. One time I had him at 35, 35 yards broadside, and he was actually out there feeding on a cottonwood leaf. I hadn't seen that very often, but he, he ate two cottonwood leaves. I actually got videoed him while he was doing this, and I just never could get that shot. And the way that all planned out, uh, my brother ended up killing that deer a couple weeks later. So – um, you know, when I get to the rut, my 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 opportunity of, of killing a good deer really really decreases. But then we make it to late season, and we're kind of back to that back to that Find that feature again. That feature again. Those late dropping nut those are late dropping red oaks, and that's kind of kind of where I go back to that. Last year got beat on that. <clears throat> my brother Josh killed that one deer. I moved to a completely different area on one of my favorite <clears throat> pieces of public land to hunt. And I got on a, a really nice, he was probably that high 40s, low 150s, 10 point. Saw him twice. Had him within 60 one time. Never could, never could just hone him down. So, you know, last year was a, you know, it was a rough year. And you're, as a hunter, you know, you're going to have him years. Oh, that's I right. Mean, I mean, you're going to be, 
You're going to get humbled down if you're a bow hunter, I promise you. Oh, yeah. It's coming. It's just like mm-hmm. like batting. You're going to have slumps. That's you, it. You're going to get hot, and then you're going to get last year, man, they kicked me in the teeth. I'll tell you right now. <laughs> you say you're rough, but also uh, I think something bit important about this, you're still having those encounters. The thing is, though, about your hunting style, and, like, you know, I, I'm going to say this. Your, um, so that goes back to kind of what no. I was talking to today. <laughs> that goes back to the the whole mental aspect of the traditional side. It's it's extreme. No, you are you are what I would call you're embracing the suck, and the suck mm-hmm. is you don't have that range, okay? And just like embrace the suck, like like just mental and everything. So like with, with you like going through like the mindset. This kind of goes back to your seminar about you know you're going to traditional archery. You know you're not shooting 40, 50 yards anymore. Yeah, like you could with a compound or even further like some of these guys like you know hunter hogan and josh trollinger um so but you still had those encounters it's just like it's you know like you said you might not feel that tag but you were right there on the cusp and for whatever reason just you couldn't get that extra distance that you need but he was right compound in your hand compound a couple of those bu- one of that buck one of those bucks the buck your brother probably killed probably would have been dead I never would have killed that deer <laughs> no he, he never would have seen that deer I, I don't know had him done but so so that's the beauty of me for for traditional that personally that's what i truly love about about the traditional ball game is is trying to get that extra step i mean it is it it, it it's just more of a challenge and it, it's not trying to be cocky by any means or anything but it's just a fact it's, it's kind of like a rifle hunter versus a bow hunter yeah uh, i mean it, it's it's kind of the same step it's your passion yeah it's it's my it's passion your- but but <clears throat> as a rifle hunter you know you've got what well, heck but man with a rifle today if you can see 400 yards they got one of them more janofsky scalps or whatever <laughs> them things is you can smash that joker you know what i'm talking about yeah. and then you and then a man wants to pick up a bow hey you just changed the ball game. You just you just made it that much harder on yourself. When you go to the trad route, you just made it that much harder on yourself. When you go to the what I call the creme of the creme de la creme, the guys that are flint napping their broadheads, <laughs> making their own bows, you just took it another step. You, you know what I mean? It's just it's to each their own. It's whatever fuels your fire. And I tell everybody, it, it you know it doesn't matter what weapon you choose to hunt with doesn't matter what size of animal you're after if you're completely happy with with you know harvesting deer with a gun or crossbow compound recover whatever spear keep, whatever don't keep matter that, keep and you're happy for burner, it and you're fired up fire dude, i promise you i'm fired up for you yeah you know that that's all that matters so it, but back to the traditional do it's just it's a it's a it's a mental game can you you know guys ask me all the time well how do you find that confidence well you got to pick that stick up and you got to go hunting with it and you got to build it. You got to build on it. You got to, you got to build on that confidence. And I promise you, I can tell you this, it is going to come with failure and it's going to come with failure and you're going to fail the next year and you're going to fail. You're going to keep failing with that stuff because every year I have a deer that's just, he's just, I can't quite get him in that range. And you have to, you have to develop that mental, capacity that you can you can you deal with that can you deal with that 140 inch buck walking out of your life forever and not killing him that's what's so tough for people that's the hardest thing for people to make the switch but i can say when you do make that switch and it finally all comes together whether it be a doe spike whatever the self-gratification you get from it is just it's it's unmeasurable and and that's just that's just me personally speaking, and that's why I'm truly passionate about what I do and, and why I do it. But I promise you, you know, my trophy wall is going to be a lot thinner than most people's because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lose a lot of those deer. So it, to each their own. Enough said, bro. That's, <laughs> oh, yeah. Because it, it's, it, it's in a set. You've got to get him that close. Yeah. It's not getting yeah. in a where and, you can, like Daniel said one time today. I can get, I can cover forty yards this way, and I can cover forty yards that yep. way. Yeah. But I that's, mean, it's you know, and it's man, not one of my best buddies. My, now, my, one of my best hunting buddies. He's got a, he, he's a, he's a killer. He's a stud. He's got a wall full of big old deer, hunted all across the country, and uh, you know he, and he's a great traditional bow shot. But he, and I, I'm harping on him all the time. Like man, put the, you know, put the <laughs> compound down just. Take it a step further, but he, 
he don't want to let that 115 steer get away from him. You know, and that that's totally fine. I don't that's blame what, him. That's you know, what got me out of it. You know? That's that's me. Yeah, that's what that, I, yeah, I said. I missed that elk that time. That's I just, why I'm afraid. I to put it and, I, and I'm gonna tell you this: you brought up elk. <laughs> I've, I've been I've gotten into the elk the last few years, and I've been trying to do it with my trad bow. I've had an elk tag for three years. I went out last year, didn't draw a tag. Have not killed a single elk yet. And I promise you, I'm about ready to pick me up a wheel bow to extend my range a little bit. Because I've ate elk, it's good, and I'm tired of eating my buddy's elk. I don't eat my own elk. I'm ready to eat my own elk. And I ain't, I can't get it done with a trad bow, so I'm trying. I'm trying. It's going to happen I, And I'd love year, for though. my first one to be on public land with a trad bow, but it may take me 30 years to do it. You know, it's, it's tough. Yeah, it's tough. It's... So You say that, but you get one of the most coveted – Elk tags in the country is in yes. hardy. So yeah. man, I, yes. yeah. I, not, while not I'm on podcast, I gotta I gotta talk about that. So yes. today, while we're at the while we're at the show, I get the text that I draw or I drew uh, the coveted Arkansas elk tag. One of them, a bull tag, so, a bull tag, either sex tag. Either. And I promise you, if I got that stick bow in my hand, if that cow walks out before that bull walks out, she in trouble. Uh, <laughs> I, ain't, I, ain't, I ain't taking no chances. I promise you. So, so yeah, I'm pretty excited about that this year. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> there you go, man. Yeah, they, they give out, you said what, 25 of those I'm, per I'm, year? Honestly, I'm not sure exactly how many tags they give out, but it's not many at all. And, and you can can you use a rifle for that tag, or do you have to use a bow? You know, honestly, like all this just happened – today and yeah. i haven't really got the specifics on it i'm not sure if you, i act well i do know for sure i can use my bow because i asked i actually talked to the director of, uh, of the the elk in arkansas and he told me he said you can use your trad bow you're good to go whatever's legal for whitetail is legal for elk here here in arkansas so i do know i can use my bow honestly i don't know if i can use my rifle or not but hey I'll be honest with you. If it comes down to that last day, I might pull old 243. The old man bought me when I was 13 years old <laughs> and smash me an elk if if that's legal. And I'm not even sure if, if I can use a rifle yeah. or not. You know, man, that's that's crazy. Well, fellas, we've been we've been going for two and a half hours. We could go for two and a half more easily here, but uh, to get to a point of wrapping up, I was just wondering, like, what kind of concluding thoughts you might have from this weekend from the Mobile Hunters Expo? We we got to talk to a lot. And I mean a lot of different people. I think we're all, you know, we're all, we're all lucky. We still have our voices. We've been talking all weekend. But uh, what are maybe some takeaways from this weekend, just from the the people you talk to, whether it be you know like other guys who you know that maybe you've hunted with or, or you've talked to on the internet or whatever, or just or just random people you've met. I'll start with you, Jeremy. Like what what have been some takeaways? Oh, I just especially our little round table yesterday. We sat there just listen to these other guys, and you see how pacific areas are how they hunt that was just sort of amazing to me I, I i like that i love that mm-hmm. uh, uh you know that was the sort of takeaway and you know that's right up my wheel out i love i love talking and learning yeah jonathan what, what about you yeah I, i'd have to agree i mean uh sitting around with jeremy daniel hunter josh mr michael um you know just just getting everybody's take from everything and and learning how everybody does their own thing and everybody's you know very successful at what they do in their region and and just learning different things it's awesome and as far as the the event in whole man <clears throat> you know man it's 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 june 25th <laughs> like where i'm from in arkansas the culture i'm around ain't nobody worried about no deer on june 25th <laughs> so it's really cool to get out here and get with a bunch of guys and not like a ton of folks like i don't know how many people y'all had at that thing but everybody's there because they're they're either one they're passionate about hunting already or they're wanting to get into it and it's really it's really uh it's really cool to come out and be able to talk to people that that really just want to either know deer hunting or they they have a lot to share i mean heck y'all had mr bobby worthington there i mean you know i i was you know Heck, I was excited whenever you, you carried me up there and introduced me to him and I could talk to him and all the stuff he's killed and everything and, uh, you know, being a trad man, you know, something I'm passionate about. But but also just, just uh, you know, meeting a lot of people and, uh, and uh, well, another thing, getting out of my comfort zone a little bit, talking <laughs> – uh, you know, I might have had to, had to go have me a few drinks before I before I did my little spill and talked in circles and all that. But no, it was a it was a good experience and and greatly appreciate y'all having me up here. 
Yeah, uh, man, it's been fantastic. Uh, Daniel, I'll pitch it to you, man. What about you? Oh, just, you know, meeting new people, learning new styles, techniques across the country. And, uh, I, you know, I think I might have met a few new friends. I don't know. They may have left and said, forget that guy. Hey, hey if Daniel tell me where those deer are at in Arkansas, we'll be friends. <laughs> I, you got my number. I'll tell you later. Hey, hey. <laughs> he'll sell you that pen, though. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, wait a minute. I cut you a deal. That'll work. That'll work. <laughs> I, I give you like 20% off. <laughs> I give you a promo code. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Use promo code Southern for 20% off his pen. <laughs> Scott, what about you, man? Man, I'm, I'm, I'm here to to rep for you guys, man. <laughs> and I'm, I'm a fan. I, I'm, you know, I, I'm, and, and to meet guys like this, it's, it's, it's an honor, you know, just to, just to kind of. Get in, get in the groove, share what little bit of knowledge I know, which is not a whole lot, but, you know, uh, just experience it. Yeah. 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 Absolutely, man. Yeah. Carl? Man, I'm humbled being here. This is a, yeah. This is like I'm the court jester invited to perform for the royalty <laughs> to provide the comedy. <laughs> yeah. Dude over here smashing deer with a traditional bow. Yeah. <laughs> and for us, like the west of the Savannah River is the Midwest. <laughs> Darn near. Uh, I mean, they're living yeah. the salt life. Is that what they're doing? <laughs> <laughs> hey, one thing I've learned. One thing to. I've learned is those deer over there are living the salt life. <laughs> yeah. <for sure. laughs> Where do you see the turkeys that eat fiddler crab? <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> It, I mean, it's just a, it's a whole nother world out there apparently. And just, it's cool hearing the stories from another place where it's just so much different than what we deal with. And like y'all go in with plans. We're, we're wandering around in the dark. <laughs> that's what works for us. And that's what works the best and it, it you know what y'all do works the best for you and it's just it's cool getting to talk to y'all and getting to hear what y'all yeah. do and um what i should be doing apparently <laughs> to <laughs> knock down big deer but i mean hats off to y'all for what you do and and getting on them it's impressive awesome man well, I, I want to say thanks to all you guys for coming out here and doing this podcast. It's, it's midnight, so we've been rolling for a while. I think this is about a 15-hour day for pretty much all of us. So it's been a long one, and we definitely appreciate y'all coming out and talking deer, and I know the, the listeners appreciate it too. So uh, thanks, everybody, for listening. Thanks, these guys, for coming out, and uh, we'll catch y'all next week on the next episode of the Southern Outdoorsman Podcast.